Yeah. But I don't, actually, I don't... On, on a phone, you might not be able to because okay. you're going to be watching. <laughs> it's important you see the gameplay. Um, yeah. So that's that's the important thing. Yep. All right, there we go. I think we, we are live. Uh, so, all right. Uh, yeah, we're, we're live to Twitch, so we'll just get into it here. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're back. And apologies for the technical difficulties, uh, but we're here with a pretty random, uh, but I think it's going to be cool, stream, and I'll explain in a second. Uh, but first, I'm Rob Zachney, and I'm here with our old friend from Motherboard, uh, Matthew Galt. Hello, hello. And Matthew's going to be playing some Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War uh, in just a second. But uh, we're also joined by Rick Perlstein, the author of Nixonland and most recently Reagan land and you know the foremost historian let's say of the modern conservative movement's origins across a four volume series starting with the Goldwater insurgency through the election of Ronald Reagan uh, Matthew Rick welcome to Waypoint hi Hello, now we're gonna do frog we're gonna do a stream of uh, Frogger right my favorite video game yeah um, that's that's what we're that's what we're here to do we're going to play the arcade hits of the years uh, that uh, of the years of the conservative rise. Um, Great, I'm ready. We'll just, we'll just cover it that way. Uh, I no, hope you so, have joust. Uh, yeah, joust two, not joust one. Yeah, no, not not that trash. Uh, but we today we've got Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, uh, and that prominently features Ronald Reagan and late Cold War era politics in its marketing and in its story. And uh, Rick, for your context and for other folks who might be joining us who don't follow video games too closely, Call of Duty began its life as a series about World War II and really about like World War II movies and TV shows of the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Call of Duty was, was basically like a uh, band of brothers in the game uh, for a number mm. of years. Then in 2007, they debuted Modern Warfare, and it became this really dark, bloody fantasy of the War on Terror. And that became such a hit that they started making Call of Duties every year, so they created a different brand, uh, Black Ops. And Black Ops has always been a little different from the rest of the Call of Duty series. Matthew, uh, you want to... starting stream and then if I can get a volume check that's uh, in yep. some way testing yeah uh, we will see if this comes back <laughs> okay people are saying it's back uh, and before we get into the history of black ops uh, let's see people are still saying I'm quiet I'm quiet as a little mouse quiet as a little Do mouse do I sound particularly quiet to y'all? You sound good on this end. Yeah, you sound fine okay. here. I've pumped so, you up in the, the mix settings. Okay. Um, so, yes, people are saying now it is now it is better. But Okay. Um, yeah. All right. All right. Can everybody hear us? 
Yeah, um, apparently you're coming in a... L apparently you're coming in a little hot, uh, Matthew, but I think... I'm, okay. I'm, I'm coming in a little too loud. Yeah, my... Yeah. Um, anyway, hold on. Now people are saying... Okay, I think we might just need to leave it here. Cause, okay. Uh, people are saying we're close, and I think for today, uh, close... Kato is saying it's more that you were quiet. Yeah. So, I've, I mean, I've pumped you up as loud as uh, as I can make you, Rob. Yeah, I know. I think it. I I sound fine. I'm I'm hearing myself, which is why I'm suddenly finding it hard to talk. Gotcha. Um, if you're watching that stream. Okay. Yeah, but it seems fine. Okay. Anyway, um, so Galt. Yes. Um, Black Ops. Black Ops. Okay, uh, so. Yeah, so what is this compared to the rest of Call of Duty? So, Black Ops is one of their most popular uh, sub-versions of Call of Duty. It is Call of Duty in the paranoid style. So this is the Call of Duty uh, as imagined by every dark and horrible thing uh, that we thought the CIA was doing or knew about them doing in the 60s and 70s. This is uh, every conspiracy theory is true. Um, America and Russia are forever at odds. And uh, we live in a nightmare world where nuclear weapons could go off at any moment. Um, I would say, you know, there's, for example, there is a mission in one of the earlier Call of Duties where you uh, attempt to assassinate Castro. Um, and you actually p physically play that out in the game. Whoa. Yeah. So uh, it's funny, as I was thinking about as we were setting up this stream, the way that... Um, Call of Duty games get away with this kind of like radical reactionary politics that you no longer see on mainstream television or in mainstream movies. It doesn't fly anymore, but you can do it in a Call of Duty game. Wow. Is there an exploding cigar involved? Uh, I believe there is a, right, Rob, there's an exploding cigar mission in one of the Black Ops, right? I think there might legitimately be some yes. sort of like, we need to take out Castro. Uh, or, or else freedom will be dead. I think somebody, somebody in uh, the Twitch chat also pointed out, Ollie North was a consultant for one of these games. Uh, so there, <laughs> there is kind of a, there, there is, there is kind of a uh, connection between this series and, uh, you know, the the Reagan administration. Right. Um, I would say the game in general is pure Reagan land. It's what I've been thinking of as I've yeah. been as I've been writing about it today and thinking about it. Um, is that it is very much reflects of the world that he perhaps thought we were living in and how he would have oh, liked wow. to have handled things. Well, uh, and in the early '60s, we're we're kind of living in that world. I mean, there literally was a you know CIA you know program to try and assassinate Castro, and one of the ideas was an exploding cigar. And uh, there was an idea maybe they can somehow slip him some poison that'll make his beard fall out and humiliate him. And there was even an idea to kind of fake the shooting down of an American plane so we can have something to, ret to, to um, you know, seek retribution again. So, but yeah. So you, you, I mean, you point out something I think is really interesting that's important to help put this particular game in context because it starts in 1981, um, and mm -hmm. it's right after. America had just learned about all of that stuff, right? Right. This is that was just a... 75 was when, when, when all that stuff came out, yeah. Right, so, like, America had a very particular view of the Central Intelligence Agency specifically, who are the mm -hmm. heroes, ostensibly, of, of this particular game. Um, and I think we're ready to jump into some of it, Rob. What do you think? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you wanted to lead off with some of the table setting moments yes. in uh, Cold War. Right, so we're going to show you uh, the intro cinematics, kind of the way this game sets up its story. We're going to begin with No More Hostages. <laughs> oh my gosh, my childhood. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. 
It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. Some U.S. intelligence analysts believe America is already in a state of war with the Soviet Union. Are Soviet spies living among us? 52 American citizens have been taken hostage at the American Embassy in Tehran. An unnamed White House official claims that a Cold War disaster could be just around the corner. Mr. President, we have two names linked to the hostage situation. Arash Kadavar and Kasim Javadi. Just give the word. It's time to send a message. There will be no more hostages. So there's our initial setup. Obviously, we're going to be talking about the Iran hostage crisis. Oh. Reagan was obsessed with hostages long before the hostage crisis. Really? Uh, well, yeah. shall, I, shall I dilate upon that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so he was actually in a movie in 1954. It was supposed to be his big comeback movie when his career was going into a tailspin called Prisoner of War. And there was a huge national panic uh, after the Korean War that a bunch of Korean War prisoners, prisoners of war from the Korean War had... Um, wanted to stay in North Korea, and they'd been quote-unquote brainwashed. Oh, I don't want to miss this, though. <laughs> All right, we anyway. can, let's dive into this real quick, then. We can, we can, because I think you're going to like yeah. this and have... This. Yeah, I've seen this part, yeah. Well, I think I don't it's, want, I don't want it's a little bit longer than... Miss it. Yeah, 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 let's, let's, let's dive in here. 1943. Detailed information from the Manhattan Project was stolen from Los Alamos by the Russian spy known as Perseus. 1968, Vietnam War. Viet Cong soldiers orchestrated by Perseus attempted to steal an American-made nuclear bomb from a U.S. firebase. Five days ago, while on a mission, we acquired intel that Perseus is in play again and planning an attack on the West. Perseus. The CIA's analysts consider him to be the single largest threat to the free world. Mr. Hudson, we're all aware of Perseus. We're also aware he's more myth than fact. I mean, Perseus As soon as I saw this, I was like, oh my God, they actually have Russian real Reagan administration officials. That's Alexander Haig. Allow me to introduce yep. the man that suited the responder. And we're trying to place the other guys CIA. in this room. Yeah, oh, I'll help you. Officer. I've well, there's James blinded. Baker. He's one of the few oh, people. Baker? That's who it was, it's Baker. Yeah. Uh, and this guy looks like Robert Redford, which is really fascinating because he was a left winger, very anti Reagan. You don't have to, sir. Yeah, that's Baker. <laughs> yeah. Then a lot of well, our theory is he's the spy game Robert Redford that? character, uh, so which is also sort of a very black balance blackness. in the Cold War. Uh -huh. After 13 years of silence, if he's active, something big is going to happen. Something that will affect the free world. The free world. Go. Please sit down. Sir, sir, Mr. President, sir, Mr. President, Mr. President, this is Jason Hudson and Russell Adams. I know their names. Who do you think approved their last mission? He knows everything. Is the threat real? Yes, sir, we believe it is. Can you stop Perseus? We can, sir. I've already submitted the requisition for my team. Sir, their requests are highly irregular, most likely illegal. If the press gets a hold What the hell are you talking about? Do you know who we are? Every mission we go on is illegal. Sergeant Woods, plausible deniability is the backbone of our work. Al, we're talking about preventing an attack on the free men and women of the world. Give Mr. Adler whatever he wants. Gentlemen, you've been given an important task. Protecting our very way of life from a great evil. There is no higher duty. There is no higher honor. And while few people will know of your struggles, rest assured, the entire free world will benefit. I know you won't fail us.
shall we uh, discuss? Yes, yeah. please. Give us give us your thoughts on the setup for this game. Well, so when I mentioned on Facebook that I was doing this and, and that the, this game struck me as kind of fascist, that fascism adjacent, yeah. uh, one of my Facebook friends said, well, I, I uh, how, you know? And um, actually wrote a little note. Uh, uh, so basically what Reagan is saying is there, there are pitiless, transcendently evil and omnicompetent enemies out there, invisible enemies out there destroy the way of life of the good guys who are so transcendently good that they can break any law and still be transcendently good. Because after all, if they don't, the transcendently evil and omnicompetent enemy will destroy everything that's good, true, and beautiful. Um, and so, you know, so it, it divides the world into an incredibly Manichaean scheme. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's fiction in a way, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's popular culture. It's not purporting to be history, but, you know, we can get into this more and more in this, you know, actual fact, you know, when this was set, you know, the Soviet Union was this kind of pathetic, dying, you know, regime uh, that couldn't, you know, scheme its way out of a paper bag. Right, so clearly the the whole setup of the show, the the, the video game, you know, demands this, um, you know, suspension of disbelief and this idea that you know the Soviet Union, um, you know, wants to take over the world, can take over the world, and um, never actually really believed or tried to take over the world. That was pretty much the foundation of the, you know, kind of red scare conspiracy theory. Um, you know, they 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 had you know when we had hundreds of intercontinental ballistic missiles in the early 60s, you know, they had like six, you know, they weren't, you know, trying to, you know, dominate the world. Um, they were trying to do a lot of things, right, that ordinary countries try to do, uh, you know, expand their security perimeter and all the rest. Um, but, you know, that, that, that reality is just completely wiped out in this, uh, this, this scenario, which, you know, really does resemble, um, what actually happened and what they would actually believe in the Reagan administration when it came to, uh, you know, what the Soviet Union was into in Central America. I don't know if we want to get into that or not. Well, but I, I mean, the, the, yeah. I'm very interested in this notion that, like, in that uh, montage, you have all these different moments in the Cold War being strung together as oh, right, yeah. the, Soviet, the Soviet plot. It's um, all tied together, right? It's not, it's, history is not uh, this one thing after another, this set of contingencies, it's uh, all directed, you know, from behind the scenes by this very small group of string pullers, which is, you know, classic conspiracy theory. Right. All right, are we Just ready? One guy. Are we ready to go and get the uh, the bad guys responsible? Yeah, I mean, maybe one, 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 one more point. I mean, Alexander Haig is playing uh, kind of this classic role in these um, right-wing conspiracy theory narratives, which is the, basically the quizzling bureaucrats who don't have the will to do what needs to be done and, you know, are insisting on, you know, this fastidious, uh, you know, uh, following of the law. And they're, they're the ones, they're the only people in all these conspiracy theories who are keeping us from, you know, dominating and defending the free world. Um, Stab in the is back. Is there a reason Haig would be... So I don't remember how all these various guys are remembered uh, in the Reagan verse. Does Haig emerge from this as somebody who's viewed as a, as, a, as a you know good supporter of Reagan? Or is he viewed as one of those, like, more of a creature of Washington who let, who let the Gipper down? I'm, I'm curious if there's a reason he's singled out as kind of the little worm who's being, like... Um, you know, we can't let these badasses uh, do what needs to be done because uh, rules and procedures. Right. Yeah, I mean, not really. He was a Washington figure going back to Nixon. He was, you know, Nixon's the NATO chief and the Nixon's. I think it's, it, he's a fair, fair stand in for kind of the deep state, the Washington bureaucracy. Yeah. And in real life, you know, he, he was kind of power hungry and his most famous act after. Reagan was assassinated was to say I was in charge and kind of implied right. that he was the president now. But, you know, he's, he's a fair enough uh, stand-in for, you know, the guys in Rocky who aren't going to let us, I mean, not, not Rocky, <laughs> Rambo, who are not going to let us win. And he was the Secretary of State, right? And the Secretary of State, the State Department is always kind of seen as, um, yeah, the bureaucrats, you know, the quizlings, the people who, 
uh, you know, are into diplomacy as opposed to, you know, the Secretary of Defense and the military. So he wants diplomacy and wimpiness. So the next thing we're going to get into is um, the opening of the game. And it really does, I think, sort of put a marker down about what this, this game is going to be about. But you sort of got a taste of it there, which is that... Um, we have found the people who caused the entire uh, embassy hostage crisis, oh, okay. and we're gonna go get them. And it turns out, if you're thinking we're gonna we're gonna go get the Ayatollah, no, we're not. Uh, it's a we're study, going, it? Yeah, we're we're gonna go find these uh, you know these go betweens uh, in Berlin uh, who have who Amsterdam have actually. Landed. They're in Amsterdam. Let me okay. let me quickly quickly um, be the, the 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 kind of the wet blanket on that one. Actually, this. The people who took over the hostages were this kind of pathetic group of students who really didn't know how to do anything. And the only reason they were allowed to do it was because the Ayatollah kind of watched on TV and saw how much, you know, kind of a program they were getting from the population. And as a matter of fact, there was a debate within the group of students um, whether to take over the American embassy, which they wanted to do for like a day or two. I just kind of got out of hand uh, or the Soviet embassy. They despise the Soviet Union and America equally. So basically, what this kind of like Keystone Cop situation that you know ends up changing history is the furthest thing from some kind of you know coherent plot to kind of humiliate, take over, you know, forces of freedom. So that was so. not even that was not even a fight that Iran's revolutionaries wanted to have. Like they didn't not at even... all, okay. not at all. They they backed into it, and uh, you know I'd get into this in Reagan. Okay. Buy the book. Okay. Yeah, buy, buy Regaland. We're gonna get the we're getting to the truth uh, behind a lot of the myths around the the hostage crisis. Uh, nevertheless, no students here. Uh, Matthew, you wanna you wanna take us through uh, some some rough justice? Let's let's do this. Okay. Realism. <laughs> We've already shot realism out the window. Well, yes, yeah. the, the haircuts are period appropriate. So okay. I think you're, you're going to be right. They always, get, they always get the buttons right in the historical This guy's movies. done more for less. He'll look the other way. Oh, my God. All the hits to my youth. Billy Squire. Hello. Glad you could join us, Hans. You remember me, We cleared a move on the target. Kasim is in his apartment, but he's well protected. I can keep my men out of the area for 15 minutes. I hope you brought an army. We brought enough. Pleasure doing business with you, Hans. And I do want to point out it is New Year's 1981. We don't want to let him. This is. Okay, so Reagan's not even president yet. Right. But he's sort of given the word that he would, like, he's yeah. given this his blessing. Uh, so the government, the transfer, we got kind of the opposite situation. The transition has already clock. happened it's not um, secretly, and uh, the Black Ops boys babies. are rolling out. Party are okay. Trouble. That's not really how it works, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the conspiracy theory is also that Reagan kept them in, 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 in Tehran, you know, so he could, like, free them gloriously on his in, in inauguration day, so. Someone's signals Save. got crossed. Oh, laser really sight. I got one of those. Kazim has info we need. Everyone else can take a powder. Apartment's just up ahead. Now, me personally, I would have probably sent the cops to arrest this entire cell. Um, but fast. Reagan's Let's done go. screwing around, and uh, that's, oh, yeah. that's not what the plan is. That's here. what that's what the police, the rules, the law. That's what got us into this mess Let's in the first place. Bring in the new Light him up, Mason. Go, go, go! So all um, terrorists rent out apartments with broad picture windows in the middle. This they, question they, not being of the Terrorists love the um, stylish downtown brownstone. Um, this is a fantastic one. I do have to say. Um, I can't escape. I would I would love to hide from the authorities in a place like this. Um, how many like, so it's a very big cell as you can as you can tell. Matthew, is that is that you? Uh, 
kicking kicking butt and taking names there. Oh yeah. Excellent work. Thank you. Clearly you have a backstory. <laughs> is now taking us across several rooftops uh, oh, yeah. in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and they haven't and they haven't even invented part four yet. Right. Your guys are already good at it though. They invented it. This is the moment that parkour was was uh, also not true. No. Oh, right in the face. The thing about these games is that it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, right. So, while Matthew's doing an awful lot, a lot of these scenes, one of the notorious things about this game is that you can bypass a lot of this, uh, because uh -huh. really this thing is set up to deliver you uh, to the next, uh, you know, to the next story beat, and here, and we're about there. Okay. Another thing about the students who took over the hostages, the hostages they were always incredulous that Americans didn't understand that their tra their cause was just, and that you know America was the the, the, the kind of beacon of freedom, and the what their what their whole demand was was to return the dictator to to Iran to face trial, the Shah, you know. So wouldn't Americans understand that? They were naive kids, basically. Oh. Wait, wait, oh, that's wait. one way to get uh, information. I, I just handle the money. I have no idea where Arashi is. I don't so, think you understand the situation. Ah! This game gives you an option here about whether you want to execute this you guy. Have rules. You and it badly, oh. like, it the badly wants change. you to, to execute him. I will show you how badly, actually, Rob. Wait, wait. So what am I missing? What, how is that indicated to the player? Let's see the uh, I've got these options. Oh, you get to here. choose your questions. Oh I yeah. Can, you can throw, or I can ask. Oh, oh, I swear, I swear oh, I don't so know. it's indulging the kind of status of the player to give oh. them a dopamine hit. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna release him. There you All right. Go. Release him uh, down. Oh, that, uh, that's how you're releasing him. I thought you meant like release him to the, to the ground. <laughs> the street level. I gave you what you asked for. I can pay you whatever you want. Don't. Oh. <laughs> whatever you say, Pantrello. We got what we can do. Hudson. It's like the worst exploitation movie. Yeah. I did eventually like say we're gonna take him and we're taking him in. No, I really we're gonna take him in and, and then and then we took him in. Uh, so hold on. How long before we I might be about to get really loud. For okay. Team we're team we're still saying I'm very ago. low. Okay. And I'm boosted shortly. to max in Discord, so I'm about to make a executive decision. Alright. So the player kind of has to find out who Arash is and what his game is. Right, and so now we're now Arash is in Turkey in an airfield, and we're about to go get Arash. How are my levels? You sound louder. Okay. Uh, people are also saying is predominantly probably game audio. Okay. Being a little a little high, but it, well, it's I can bring that really... down in the. In the settings yeah. all around, and just do a master volume, cut it to 75, and we'll see how we feel. Uh, yeah, I would say 70. You just want to go down to 70? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Now people are happy. Okay. People are joyous. Uh, folks are, I think, asking about subtitles, but I think subtitles are on. They're just not great, they're, right? Yeah, they're really inconsistent. Let's go take a look at that setting. Um, where is that? Uh... Voice chat, advanced, simulation, game sound, interface, subtitles. Ah, enabled. There we go. I apologize, everybody. Yes, subtitles. That's weird, should but be... the cutscenes, the, the scripted sequences were subtitled. That's yeah. the first thing. Yeah, yeah, that was throwing okay. me off. Okay, so now we should be good on all that. All right. 
Mason, check it out. Yep, there we go. Okay, so, um, yeah. now we found where the other cell is. We got another team dispatching these guys. And, uh, this is, this is sort of where we're going to get the outline of, of what the rest of this game is going to be, which is bringing Perseus uh, to, to justice. I really like the design of the Arash for some reason, because it feels like America's conception of like an Iranian radical. Uh, mm. You'll see here in a second when we get like a close-up. He's got the, the tiger jacket and the... Yeah. This is also basically America's conception of a narco war soldier. Yes. Uh, in the eighties mm. as well. So um it's right. it's interesting. Uh bundling you know. up all the bad guys. Yeah. Uh so there was a thing at the end of that sequence where that where that guy was being uh threatened uh with being thrown off the roof before being executed. Uh which is that he sort of he tries to argue that um you know, you guys can't execute him. America has rules. And uh, Adler, the, the dude controlling the mission, uh, says, uh, you took hostages. There are no rules anymore. Something to that effect. And I think one of the threads in this game is that it has this notion of the gloves need to come off. America right. is, is fighting with one hand tied behind his back. But what it really needs to do is be fully unleashed and able to do whatever it needs to doing and i'm curious is that a, when does that become a through line in conservative thought i associate it with the war on terror but does it oh, have... no, 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 no. it probably goes back to the french revolution i mean this is like the real deal here uh the idea that you know um the world is ruled by uh, you know the pitiless use of force uh is um you know pretty much the whole name of the game i was actually looking up on my pro uh, on my um computer uh, a similar quote um, from Ronald Reagan in a 1980 campaign speech about how like you know Jimmy Carter you know wants America to be liked but the real thing is the real important thing is for America to be respected uh, you know our country is not strong anymore we're not respected anymore we talk about state times the Soviet Union knows what they wanted to time and they've been winning we have not known what we wanted and we've been out freighted in almost every instance yeah, you know, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. Explain the concept of detente. Uh, so, oh, I think detente like... is, uh, so this is an interesting context, too. So basically, before Reagan became president, um, it, it's very interesting that we talk about 1989 and 1990 being the end of the Cold War, because by the by the kind of the time uh, of the opening of China and the Salt Agreement in 1972, um, it was pretty much the consensus among pundits that the Cold War itself had already ended. And so kind of right, Reagan kind of had to start the Cold War again before the Cold War could be ended by Reagan. And, you know, it's pretty much, um, you know, what had happened with detente was basically that was the idea of, um, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States negotiating with each other on areas of mutual interest. You know, we'd signed a nuclear uh, treaty called Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. You know, uh, we pretty much figured out a way to kind of live together without, you know, sort of a risk of a war breaking out. Uh, and a huge part of what conservatives were up to in the early and middle 1970s, especially after the uh, Nixon administration and what made Reagan run for president in 1976, was this idea that detente was phony. The time was a scheme and a scam that had been dreamed up by the Soviet Union to disarm the United States. And uh, Ronald Reagan was very big on that idea. So here he's kind of spitting defiance with his last breath and telling us that uh, the plan is already in motion. Right. Here's a Reagan quote. Uh, the, Ra the Carter administration's principal argument for signing SALT II, which is a arms deal with the Soviet Union, is that no one will like us if we don't. His argument for giving away the Panama Canal, which was returned to Panama, uh, was that no one will like us if we didn't. Isn't it time we stop worrying about whether anyone likes us, decide if we're going to be respected in the world? Respected to the point that never again will any dictator dare to invade an American embassy and hold our people hostage. And of course, the dictators hadn't done it. It had been this hapless group of students. Adler's in West Berlin. He should be at the safe house. So we're going to skip through that. 
and we're gonna jump off of that if we can. You know, and, and and he would say really, you know, kind of crazy extreme stuff like, um, you know, the the Soviet Union intends to give us an ultimatum, and you know, by the year, you know, whatever, nineteen ninety five or something, and if we if we don't, you know, surrender to them, they were gonna um, start a nuclear war. He, he would. This is kind of that's the crazy Reagan that his advisors were always trying to kind of tamp down. To what degree is crazy Reagan an authentic Reagan versus a posture, uh, in your view? Oh, completely, one hundred percent authentic. That's the real guy. This is the same guy who thought he was fighting a communist takeover of Hollywood in the nineteen forties, you know, and 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 you know was issued a gun by the police that kind of saw himself as this, you know, kind of counterinsurgent himself. It was, I think, you know, there's lots of reasons why. Ronald Reagan went from being a liberal in the you know, 1930s and the 1940s and most of the 1950s to a conservative in the 1960s and afterwards. And one of the main reasons was, you know, the Democrats had abandoned uh, this idea that there was kind of this communist infiltration of America. And it was just so important that, you know, this guy who never really fought in World War II, and you know, he had a kind of desk job at a movie studio, right. uh, was really kind of fighting this war uh, of, of, you know, kind of good versus evil. His eyes were the, bad, right? Uh, his eyes were bad. He actually, um, he lied about his eyesight, but not in order to fight in World War II. He lied uh, about his eyesight to be able to be able to join the horse cavalry at, uh, at a, in, 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 in the Army Reserve in the 1930s in Iowa, so he, because he loved riding horses. And then by World War II, his studio just basically made sure that he didn't get anywhere near a uh, near combat. But he was the guy at this um, military at this. Um, this this film studio where they filmed the Three Stooges that they turned into a military base to make training films, who loved ordering his troops around and pretending he was a drill sergeant. And everyone else, like, was like, like he was driving everyone crazy with this kind of like you know kind of fake you know kind of uh, you know insurgent fighting for the free world stuff. So yeah, this was extremely extremely important to his sense of who he was. All right, we're gonna jump ahead. Do you have notes for me? Rob, it sounds like you've got notes with the typing. No, no, no. Okay. All right, we're going to jump ahead to another mission called Red Light, Green Light. Uh, we are we have been tasked to go to a part of the Soviet Union and recover intelligence from a Soviet uh, uh, bunker. And oh. I'm going to highlight something very interesting at the top of this. Information from Volkov confirms their worst fears. Russia smuggled a nuclear device through East Berlin. We can't be certain of it yet. He has it. I'm sure of it. We found encrypted geo-coordinates for Volkov's nuclear intel. An unpopulated region within the Soviet Republic of Ukraine. An aerial recon run revealed this. I want to know everything that's going on inside this building. We'll need the others for this one. Mason and Woods will join us from Kiev. Bell, you'll infill here with Woods. Mason and I will be standing by for an extract. Park will handle comms. We have no idea how oh, large wow. prepared their forces will be, so use discretion if you have to engage. It's time so I'm confused, Matthew. Yes. How could they, why did they smuggle a nuclear device through East Berlin into the Soviet Union? So Perseus, in the earlier in the story, where there's a, there's a mission in Berlin where, uh, okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay, so you know how Westmoreland was like, give me the nukes as things were going bad in Vietnam. Right. Um, they gave him the nukes. They gave him a tiny little nuke that a strong that a strong person could like lumber around with. Uh, it's like the size of a, a, a trash can. You know, the, um, the 60 pound nukes that they were going to ostensibly outfit special operations soldiers with, right. to get, like those backpack nukes that they were going to carry around. Yeah. Um, Crockett's. Well, the Davy Crockett's were the, the RPGs. Okay, uh, all right, I, all right. I can't remember what the backpacks were called. So, in the world of... Here. It's all right. In the world of this game, yeah. um, as part of its nuclear deterrent policy, America has these tidy backpack nukes seeded throughout the entirety of Europe. Uh, and so what has happened is Perseus has gotten one of these and smuggled it into the Soviet Union through Berlin. And the plan is, uh, and I'll some spoilers for, for the people at home, is that Perseus wants to, like, reverse engineer the signaling feature on this nuke and then detonate all of them, destroying mm. Europe and then being able to blame that nuclear destruction on America because they were America's nukes. And the reason for this is? 
Because they're the bad guys. Okay. Got it. I'm actually like, that is basically like, Shit, Percy is just kind of a nihilist, right? Like, no political project he's pursuing, he just wants a war. Correct. He is, not, in the end, uh, well, Percy is, is not actually a person, it is a group of people in the end. Because they do that thing. Okay, so I want to highlight this real quick, actually, while we're Yeah, here. so they built a ziggurat. So this ziggurat wow. in Ukraine, these are things that we built. We built one of them in America, in North Dakota, um, okay. as part of a uh, like a radar system wow. that had lots of bunkers underneath it. Um, and this is something okay. that Call of Duty will do frequently: is it will take like historical features or things that America has done out of context. And then right. give them to the Russians, or give them to an unnamed Middle Eastern country, right. and say that oh, they like were the, actually the, the ones that did it. Oh, that's what the Deer Hunter does. You remember that in the book, Matthew, where like yeah. in the Deer Hunter, all these terrible things that America did in Vietnam are imputed to the enemy having done. Correct. Yep. Yep. Right. Yep. It's that exact or like the same idea thing. that like our allies had like you know tiger cages in which they kept their prisoners, and the American public convinced became convinced that actually it was North Vietnam who had tiger carrot cages to, to torture the prisoners. Yep. Oh, okay. So we're going to get into the space, and we're going to see what I think is like a big feature of um, 1980s uh, anti-Soviet films. Oh yeah, Wolverines. Yep. Can... Oh yeah, picking the lock. Which so of course is what Republicans did in uh, Watergate. <laughs> So this uh, is meant to be played with a controller that creates uh, little vibrations. And oh, that's so when, lovely. when you feel the tumbler moving, you're supposed to get a little like cue. Way harder oh, with the mouse or really. keyboard the way uh, oh, golf is playing. Oh my god, that's great. You've gotten pretty good in like, oh, in, like two months, Matthew. <laughs> I only ran through this once before. It's, it's the thing is like I've played... I have a sick fascination with Call of Duty in particular because I think it's such a big... In, it's such a big cultural product in America, and I really think it says yeah. a lot. Like, I think the stories we tell ourselves as a culture are very important. And increasingly, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of those stories are being told through video games. And so I think yeah. the way that we understand the military is, in a certain part, processed through these first-person shooters, of which Call of Duty is yeah. the biggest one. So I've always words, felt... Yeah. Yeah, I've always felt that it's important to, like, always play the next one and to see, like, yeah. what the conversation is and what people are talking about. And, like, why what the 18-year-olds who are enlisting in the Marines and going to Afghanistan are actually carrying around their heads. Correct. And then bringing back with them. Exactly. Headshots. I mean... Rick, like, in, in your work, like, pop culture analysis is also a huge part of the lens you turn on history, right? Like, your, yes, your approach is, like, you can't understand history but just by looking at the primary actors in, in power in politics at the moment. Absolutely. So, I don't want to get too much into the, the, the goofiness of the game, but so Perseus is not the Kremlin? No, it is a rogue element... It's Soviet, but it's a rogue element that um, okay. is taking matters into its own hands. Okay. Well, that's kind of interesting. Like, there are too many bureaucrats Ooh. in the Soviet Union. Yep. And they, yeah, they literally, he literally um, says that at the end, that they'll have problems with the, the, the committee, but they, they think they'll be fine. Stay the course and get inside. Oh. Well, that's very interesting, because there were very interesting Vietnam-like debates within the Politburo about what to do about this crisis in Afghanistan that were really kind of matched the kind of American debates over Vietnam. Oh, Galt, are you getting caught again? No, no, everything's fine. Nothing is, nothing is fine. It's so okay. bright where you are. Listen, I'm a very so stealthy... So is this the kind of, this is the kind of nuclear guidance facility, kind of? Yes. It's like a, well, they don't, they don't make it explicit, but it's based off of um, a... The design is based off of a place in North Dakota that was part of like an early missile defense system in America. Uh... Golf, is this happening because you were bad at lockpicking? No. <laughs> okay. This is just another scripted Call of Duty moment. Uh, oh, then we are you not playing right now? Yeah, it, it takes control of the game away from yeah. you at certain times to kind of make dramatic moments happen. So. You think people are getting red-pilled by this? Hmm. 
I That's mean, a good question. To me, the series, this game, this series kind of feels like it's already four people who are kind of red-pilled. Yeah. Hmm. So, like, I don't think, yeah, you don't play this and then decide to be one of those people. I think you're already playing it. You're already one of those people when you start playing it, right? Well, we can get into that Soviet KGB defector guy thing later. Are we going to get to that? Oh, yeah. It'll be okay. a big part of the... The, the twist, quote unquote, at the end of this game. Okay. Which I think we're going to be able to walk through most of it with the time that we have, actually. Ready. Okay. Well, I'm we skipping dinner. This is, this is riveting. Well, thank you. By the way, this is a good this is a good time to uh, congratulate my niece for her uh, engagement. Hi, Nora. Does Nora have a? Congratulations, Nora. Yeah. Is right. is is Nora? Oh my God! Look at those! Oh my God! Out? Yeah. So Are you? Can we? Can, can you focus in on those video games? Are those real? Yeah, uh, you can Asteroids actually play Asteroids is some... one of my favorites. Oh my god. Yeah, so oh, we can actually... Weird. Oh, Atari Grand Prix, that was a really good driving game. You go around a track. Wait, I don't know that one. Here. So, we're in a oh, Spesnas so training this is, course. This is what? my question, actually. Matthew? Yes. This Activision is the same Activision that made games for the Atari 2600. Yes. Pitfall. Yep. That was my favorite. Can you can you focus in on the pitfall screen so some people can see the video games that I played when I was a kid? Uh, unfortunately, it's just the uh, the icon. You can't actually play pitfall. In oh, this. that sucks! If this were a better game, they would have a little cut yeah. down version of it. That was you kind of play... that was very sophisticated game for its time. Oh, that's Grand Prix. Yeah, you can play Grand Prix, and I think you can play uh, like barnstorming. Beijing this... Derby. That was an Atari. Oh, 20, oh, oh, no. Nope. Oh yeah, yeah. Wait, so that was wait, it. Okay. Oh, that was kind of okay, like an Indiana Jones game. Oh my God, flashback! Holy cow! I'm in my basement on 280 West Dean Road, Milwaukee. Uh, yeah, so that was it. That was as, as sophisticated as it got. And uh, oh, I'm so bad at old games like this. So wait, so uh, I could, this... I could, I could slay you on this one. Oh, you gotta grab the rope. You get that rope. This, you gotta... Yeah, this came out right around the time of Indiana Jones was big. This would have been about 82, 83. You would, yeah. Why is he not letting go? Do I have to push? Uh, you have to you push something. Space? There we go. You it's have to down. hit the button on the joystick, the big red button. Okay, you can't go on their teeth. You gotta go on their heads. This is, this is very... In my, in, my, in my mind, Matthew, this game was the beginning of the end because... It was the whole thing where you kind of like had to like remember stuff and do mazes and kind of solve problems instead of just blasting away at the same thing over and over again. Well, yeah, I'm better uh, at the blasting. We got a request to look at the carpet. Can we, can we get a close-up of the carpet? God damn, that is, that is well, realistic. That just, looks, that, that just looks like, uh, what's a Busters? Blah, 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 and Busters. So yeah. this, is in, the, oh, this Busters. is in the Ukraine, by the way? Yes, so Next this point. is... So what we are, we're in a training facility for Spesnos to do an invasion of any town USA. Oh my god, that's a real thing. So... Every, just to, to tell you how much conspiracy theories were saturated in the Cold War, every army recruit would watch this propaganda film that actually proposed that there were real fake America towns in the Soviet Union with like soda fountains and like, you know, malt shops and, and, and high schools where they would actually train to pretend to be Americans to infiltrate the United States. And uh, one of them actually had Robert, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy introduced it. So this level of paranoia, like, crossed party lines, where it was just, like, this level yeah. of yeah. Red Scare was convinced yeah. that, and that the Soviets been were the, always... Yeah, yeah, they're on their way. And it was in the early 1960s, this was when this, this that was a thing. But again, by, like, the 80s, you know, there was no attempt to have any kind of operational capacity to kind of, you know, expand the Soviet Union. It was complete horseshit. And the whole Afghanistan thing was just this weird accident, too. And both sides thought the other side was trying to take over Afghanistan. Um, we thought that they were trying to take over Afghanistan so they could press into Iran and then take over the Saudi Arabian oil fields. And actually, Jimmy Carter was given the option of using tactical nuclear weapons in the mountain passes to stop that. Um, but it was, you know, it's just, and they thought, because we had actually already 
infiltrated this BIA into Afghanistan that we were trying to overthrow the government. So they basically invaded Afghanistan to keep us from infiltrating the government, just like we thought they were trying to infiltrate our government. And, you know, that sort of crazy kind of fog of whole war eventually led to this, you know, Vietnam-like war that, you know, did in fact bring down the Soviet Union because it was so vulnerable by that time. I mean, it's weird to think about, um, I don't know how H.R. McMaster is going to be regarded from this point forward, but, uh, I mean, this is one of the theses of Dereliction of Duty, right? Which is that, like, part of the involvement in Vietnam involves both sides signaling levels of commitment to each other, but the messages are not being interpreted quick, uh, correctly. Oh, that, that's and so, constantly the case. Constantly yeah. the case. Also, well, I mean, you got to get your Doritos advertisement in there. Oh, yeah. One of the Incredible. big things... And one of the big things in the late 1970s was this idea that um, the Soviet Union introduced the Brigade of Troops into Cuba. And that actually was the reason uh, that the, the arms control agreement, SALT II, why well, basically this time the Soviet Union began ending that in Afghanistan. And the fact of the matter is the brigade had always been there. <laughs> but there was kind of like almost literally a translation error between how the CIA talked about things and how the NSA talked about things. And kind of oh that kind of caused senators to um, misinterpret this as some kind of bold Soviet encroachment. Yeah, it was all misunderstandings. The whole thing is chaos, contingency, human error, which again does not exist in the kind of conspir conspiratorial, you know, model of the universe. Right. You know, when you know, just another example is, you know, there's this massive spontaneous outpouring uh, for a nuclear freeze uh, in the United States. It was a huge mass movement, two million people in, in, in Central Park or a million people at a big protest. And Ronald Reagan was absolutely convinced that this thing, whole thing had been you know, created by you know, Perseus, you know, to kind of weaken the will of the United States. But the weird thing about Reagan, and this is where you give him credit, is since he took so seriously the idea that the Soviet Union was evil and was trying to take over the world and would use nuclear weapons, that he turned out to be much more serious about arms control than any previous president. Because he thought that, you know, the world might end in a fiery Armageddon because the Soviet Union wanted it to. So, I mean, the fact that the people who believed in detente came to believe that, um, came to believe that, you know, the conflict with the Soviet Union was pretty much, if not over, at least kind of had reached this kind of stable equilibrium. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan in that sense might really have helped, you know, kind of advance the cause of peace. Speaking of him, uh, on that but, you know, particular with, note... With, with, you know, maybe 100,000, you know, you know, like uh, people, you know, you know, dead in genocides in Central America, you know, along the way. Not, forget that. I'm yeah, sorry, think, what were you saying, Matthew? Oh, the on the note of, like, the nuclear arms control stuff, I think it's really interesting. We've got this diary entry of his after he watches the day... Right. The day after, right? Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, the day after was a, uh, I think it was a miniseries. I don't think it was a one night TV movie. Maybe it was a TV movie. I think, movie. I I think it was remember. a, it was a TV movie. I think. Yeah, it's a TV movie. And, and, uh, I think it was Omaha. Um, this, there was a nuclear exchange, uh, that flattened Omaha and it was extremely realistic and the ratings were astronomical. Everyone watched it. I watched it. We were all, so I was born in 1969. So when Reagan became president, I was like 11 or 12 and, you know, was going through my adolescence and early high school years. And, you know, it was the idea that, that, that we not, we might not grow up to be adults was, um, was, was out there, you know, that, that there was so much tension with the Soviet Union. And of course there almost was an accidental exchange in 1982. We can talk about that. But so the day after was a huge deal and Ronald Reagan watched it. And um, uh, he, it, it, it's credited with kind of doubling his resolve to uh, begin serious negotiations for arms control with the Soviet Union. And then you get in the whole business with Reykjavik and Star Wars and that kind of strangeness. But actually, him and Gorbachev actually were on the verge of agreeing to zero out their nuclear weapons. But Reagan was so committed to this idea, this, again, fantasy movie idea of Star Wars, this you know kind of nuclear shield, which was a completely fantastical, made-up thing, uh, that Gorbachev you know, pushed away from the table and said, no way, that the only reason to have it... A nuclear shield is to you know develop your offensive capabilities. Um, 
code name Operation Green Okay, Lab, wait. Run by Hudson. Who's Hudson? He's the, the bald guy. The bald, angry guy. Who started off the briefing earlier. Is a CIA op operative. So there's a rat in, uh, in the house. So they've infiltrated Hudson's nuclear program? Yes. So in other words, the United States has an entire secret nuclear program. Correct. It's not just a secret, you know, thing that funnels ten million dollars to the Congress. It's an entire nuclear program. Yeah, that's not very constitutional. Uh, they put it in the. Uh, they they blame Eisenhower in this game for it, by the way. For what? Oh. For Project Greenlight. For all these oh, nukes incredible. getting into Europe. Yeah. They said it was an Eisenhower era project. My favorite uh, secret Cold War project was um, they wanted to test low-grade nuclear weapons. Uh, and so they created this whole uh, apparatus to propose using uh, nuclear weapons to do things like um, dig canals. And we're on the verge of actually testing some of this stuff. Uh, they killed a new Pan Panama Canal by uh, exploding a nuclear weapon in the middle of you know Central America. I forget what that one was called. Yeah, I remember that the nukes, the excavation projects, the nukes yeah, for peace. using nuclear nuclear weapons for excavation, and that but that was cover for uh, basically a you know kind of a nuclear testing program. Because we're the so, good guys. So here, so but to be clear, like Hudson's basically doing all this off the book secretly against the interests of. America and the free world, right? Like, right. no, no, no. It's, no, it's for it, the free world. It's for the free world, exactly. For its own good. No, own Hudson, good. Hudson is not a bad guy. He's just a guy that has more information than you do. Ah. So is is Hudson setting this up kind of under the authorization of higher ups, or is he a rogue? No, he's setting it up under the authorization of higher ups. He's just been running this program so long, and it's been going on so long. He's just trying to protect it. At this point, but at this moment, you 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 guys have been duped, right? Oh, this is a setup. So, are you just trying to kill as many people as possible, or what? What is your uh, actual aim? Right now, we're trying to escape. We're almost there. Are we about to have a jeep sequence, or we, we, is that just a... I see you've played a Call of Duty before. <laughs> yeah, I see. I see a jeep, so I think it's time to. What's a jeep We're in a sequence? motor pool. What's a jeep sequence? In this game, in this series, multiple times a game, uh, you will be shooting from the back of a speeding car, and then there's a subset of that, the turret sequence. Uh, where you get behind a, a, a heavy crude weapon and just murder hundreds of people. So this one we're going to get the jeep and the uh, the turret sequence at the same time. Well, hallelujah. I'm doing this on my phone so I can kind of wander around the apartment. Grab some carrot. You can't have an any, any town USA without a gazebo. Right. Um, Every town's got a good gazebo. Well, I was just telling Matthew this. In these all these little towns and that I've seen in central Illinois, they um, they have gazebos, and then they'll have like a World War II tent. To my shame, I let I let us blow up a World War II tent. Tank. Oh, tank. Yeah. Oh, tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That looks like um, Back to the Future. I think they, yeah. they actually took that gazebo from Back to the Future. It does look a lot like the town square in, uh, in that movie. The plot, yeah. That's another thing that Call of Duty does a lot, right? Is it pulls from uh, movies, other movies, other video games, and kind of appropriates that imagery. I mean, to be fair, there are lots of town squares in the Midwest that look exactly like that. So. And they're... now they're all like completely full of empty storefronts and are abandoned. Because yeah, really I, mean, I was so. thinking that, like, Boy, my, my part of the Midwest did not look that way. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you, never, you never saw those downtowns anymore. We never, you'd go down to the strip no. mall or the mall. No, and if you go to, like, you know, 
you know, Ronald Reagan's, you know, birthplace in the middle of Illinois, like, the town is practically abandoned. All right, here they confront Hudson about what's going on. Yes, sir, I'm on it. My dad had that phone, by the way. Nice. A cool early adopters uh, piece of kit. So, it, the fascinating thing about the Robert Redford thing is, he was looking at all these anti-CIA movies, like Three Days of the Condor. Yeah. Everybody stand down. This little pissing. And he was very, he was very. Okay, I'll, I'll shut up. Why didn't you tell us How am I doing, by the way? You're doing great. He needed us to clean up his mess. This is exactly what we wanted. It's like context so for a Call of Duty game. <laughs> That's what you do best, isn't I it? Could, oh, I better plug in my phone. Manipulate so could I, um... Tell them your own version of the truth. I have this book, um... Let me have a little window. Let me let me give you a little riff when everyone... Okay. Yeah. But we should listen to this. Us. Operation Greenlight. What is it? Tell us everything. Back in 58, the hey, kids, people used to smoke in, in movies. I know, right? I was convinced that the Reds moved on Europe. Oh, here we go. He respond quick enough. So he authorized Operation Greenlight, top secret program that placed nuclear bombs in every major European city. The ultimate counter oh, perfect. to a Soviet invasion. 74 of the bombs were upgraded to high Yeah, that makes no sense. I am um, so when I did my first book on Barry Goldwater, he was very big on the idea of tactical nuclear weapons that were small enough to use in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, one of the big, you know, you know, Manhattan Project guys who was still alive, um, I had an interviewed a guy named Herbert York, who was involved in all this stuff, and he told me it was just such a fantasy that any, even the smallest nuclear weapons, would have, you know, such devastating consequences like all across Europe. That the idea that somehow you could have some containable nuclear explosion, you know, was another one of these Cold War fantasies. And once Perseus detonates it, the United States becomes global enemy number one. Okay, that's exactly yeah, like Operation Tradewind. So we did that. Now, we didn't do it, but we had a, a plan on the books. Next time. Crosswinds, Tradewinds. I might not you know, someone in the audience can tell us. Where uh, we were going to shoot down a plane and pretend right. the Soviet Union had done it. There's other, I want to highlight another thing, because like we, we think about this Project Greenlight thing as being complete fantasy, and it is, but there were, um, anything else in that printout, Bell and Woods pulled let's see if there's anything else interesting here. There's mention of an excavation taking place in the Ural Mountains. No, we're going to skip that mission. Uh, but there were like bizarre nuclear plans in the Cold War era. Uh, one of them that's similar to this, and this was a British plan that never quite got off the ground. Um, they had developed nuclear landmines that they were put, going to put in the Fulda Gap. And okay, the idea right. being that if anyone crossed the Fulda Gap, they would explode these nuclear landmines and just irradiate the zone and make it impassable. Um, didn't work out. Uh, one of the big one of the big problems was that the ground was too cold and it kept like ruining the nuclear material. And so they experimented with a bunch of different ways to keep the inside of these nuclear landmines warm. And you have to understand, like, when I say nuclear landmine, we're talking about uh, an object that is, like, 15 feet tall. You could walk into it. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the solutions they came up with is they would bury chickens with the landmines, like, chickens inside of them so that their body heat would keep it warm. Oh, well, that's, that's some... Um... Yeah. Um, resourceful. Well, the sad thing was... about the sad thing about that operation is Elvis Presley would have died because he was stationed in the pull the gap. It's always funny to think about the obsession over defending the Folded Gap, where not very far in the Cold War, the layers of defenses around the Folded Gap were so dense. Um, the the notion you'd have a you know large scale armored breakthrough uh, through there seems seems pretty out there. Uh, Given well, that was how... the kind of the, the folded gap kind of thing was what um, Carter was kind of proposed. He was given a, a you know an option to actually kind of 
to, to plug up a gap in the mountains between Iran and Afghanistan with, you know, kind of a nuclear landmine kind of situation. All right, so we're going to skip ahead a little bit more. Um, we have we are on the trail of some of, of, of these nukes, and it's going to take us to Cuba. I'm going to play the briefing for the Cuba mission. Operation Northwoods is the, the, the plane shoot down thing. Gotcha. It's about time. Been waiting for your call. They caused a hell of a mess in Moscow. Was it worth it? Adler managed to get the list of sleeper agent names, despite himself. He's got balls, I'll give him that. Bell did well. Seemingly. But I think that team is getting oh, too comfortable. They're acting like they know who they're dealing with. Perhaps. Turns out, one of those... Yeah, right there, Rick. ...tied to Operation Greenluck. Theodore Hastings. He's a nuclear engineer based out of... Solar I bet his phone just died. Hastings is the one he'll activate. Exactly. Total surveillance is already underway. It's only a matter of time before he leads He'll be back, I'm sure. Process. He'll be back. Yeah, we'll give him a second. I have to get Rick on charger. Yep. Just in case he... Yep. So how far did you get into this, Rob? Uh, like, literally, I think I um, got through the Berlin stuff and then had to stop. And I haven't, like, literally, I've not played games in three days. Yeah. Um, I'm jonesing pretty hard. What are you going to play when you play games? I think Demon Souls. Really? Okay, so how are you finding that? Because you're not a Dark Souls person. Right? No, you're never have been, but I love that shit now. I'm all in. This is it. Nice. Feels so good. Like, you know what it is? It's kind of like. Cuba. Right. Kind of like racing games in some way. Like, just the feeling of control and precision and, like, just, like. And the pinning down what the course is and like where your breakpoints are it, it presses all those buttons but in the format of like a combat game and so yeah now i'm like i'm all in i, I love it i can see that i can definitely see that um do we want to give him just a minute before we before we pull the plug on this impromptu stream <laughs> yeah we'll give him a minute we'll, we should at least figure out if he's going to be able to come back yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, yeah. If if not, we can uh, we can call it there. I think we've gotten a lot of good. good I think material. we. I think we did some good work. Are the people are the people happy? I think the people are satisfied. Um, Excellent. People people have enjoyed uh, getting this this little this little analysis of the of the game. Because uh, he said he was going to he's going to get carrots and plug in his phone, and I don't think he plugged yeah. in his phone. And then he said, oh, No. Yeah. No. There's yeah. no, there's, there's no, uh, wait. Oh, what do we got? I brilliantly let my phone die. You back on? Or are you on your computer? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. We can't see you though. And I may have to adjust, uh, OBS again, which is fine. I brilliantly let my phone die. Just, just you know. Oh, Here wow. Now it's shutting down again. It's shutting down again. Um, I think we lost him. I think it may be. I think we may be done. Because he's not going to be. I don't think he's going to be able to hold the charge long enough for us to. That's right. Yes. Yes. That's not going to work. You're right. I think. Yes. I was wondering about that part. Yeah. Um, all right. So we are gonna let's let's wrap it there. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good place. I think that's a decent place to wrap. We got a lot of context. The rest of yeah. it is, the rest of it, folks. If you haven't seen the end of this Call of Duty, uh, there is an ending to this thing. There's three different endings, and the bad guys win ending is okay. Something else. People have people can have the option of bailing out at this point, but I am really dying to know. Are you dying to know? I am dying to know in the bad ending. Okay. What is going to be the end game here? We can do it if you want. Let's, you know what? Fuck, yes. All let's right. do that ending. Okay. And we can leave, right. we can leave Rick up and if he's able to come back. The people, back. the people are desperate. They are thirsting, but you should text Rick and let him know that if he doesn't, like if it doesn't make sense for him to come back, he doesn't have to. Um, yeah, hold on. Give me one second. Yeah, no problem. So it's interesting, for all the, the sound and fury of this game, is kind of doing the modern warfare thing, where um, 
the whole nationalist plot element turns out to be a bait and switch for a shadowy cabal secret conspiracy type shit. Correct. So that no, it's not actually the Russians. Uh, please buy our game, uh, Russian consumers. <laughs> Uh, but but also just this this notion um, that you can you can sort of flirt with the worst paranoid tendencies of uh, right wing nationalism, but then it turns out the the, the bad guys all along have been uh, some sort of shadowy force and maybe even the corrupted uh, you know figures behind intelligence and defense agencies. Um, and I think this is always a way that. Call of Duty has been able to uh, have it both ways mm -hmm. by sort of being able to say, like, actually, you know, you know, Lib, there's a critique of the national security state in, in these games. Uh, and that critique's basically full of shit. Like, oh, buddy, can't... just just wait till you see the ending of this game. <laughs> Sounds like I missed a good rap there. Uh, Rob was talking. Rob, yeah. Uh, well, it's the lack of a critique. It, it, we talk about how Call of Duty like flirts with this idea of being a critique of um, the military-industrial complex in America and like militarism, but it can't escape the. It, it really can't escape, you know, its roots. All right, we're going to do this. Uh, all right, so we're looking for a sleeper agent in Cuba. We're going to go ahead. Uh, Rob and I have committed to finishing out the rest of this game because it gets real weird here at the end. Okay. Let me let me um, make a really interesting point about Cuba, actually, while we're kind of debunking Cold War mythology. There's this new book. I haven't quite read it yet, but it's called Visions of Freedom, Havana, Washington, Pretoria, and the Struggle for Southern Africa. And it's by a historian named Piero Gleheas. And one of Reagan's big obsessions was the Soviet encroachments in Africa, you know, and he, of course, you know, like supported, you know, the South African government for Cold War reasons. And the interesting thing about this book is it establishes that the, the tens of thousands of troops that Castro sent to Angola had this very profound effect on basically convincing the South African apartheid government to end apartheid. So in a lot of ways, the communists were the good guys in Africa, if, it is, if you think that ending apartheid advanced freedom. It's yeah. funny. One of the uh, one of the multiplayer maps. It's not part of the single player campaign, but one of the game, one of the maps you play on in multiplayer is set in Angola. Um, it's in a, it's set against the backdrop of the conflict in Angola. Uh, in this particular game, that's interesting. Did we lose him again? Okay. Yeah, we did. We're gonna barrel forward. We're gonna barrel forward and get into Cuba. Yeah. All right, so we are jumping into. Uh, so yeah, just Hastings left Salt Lake City. I'm gonna I'm gonna send an email on that on that thread uh, and just let Rick know that like if his phone's at zero, Discord is going to kill it every time. Yeah, yeah, 100. percent In exchange for a peek at the hardware, of course, that isn't gonna happen. What's the plan? The last read we have on Hastings came from 30 miles south of Havana. We suspect Perseus is using an abandoned compound there to hold the nuke. They're working under the radar, so expect models. All right, so at this point in the game, Rob, we have figured out that Perseus and sleeper agents have this nuke in Cuba. So we have to go to Cuba to get that nuke back. Hastings in Cuba is to prepare it for arming and detonation. There you have it. Hudson will arrange our exfil while we're en route. If everyone's ready, let's move out. Adler's late. No love, we're early. Adler should be checking in right about... Park, we're in position. Copy that. We're moving to flank. All teams, we do this fast and loud. Find Hastings, grab the nuke, get the hell out. Woods, light up this joint. It's about fucking time. Go, go, go! Rob, let me know when you're back. Uh, he, uh, Rick says he will be back in five minutes. He's going to let his phone charge. Enemy 
will have more analysis of uh, Call of Duty, Black Ops, Cold War, with historian Rick Perlstein, author of Reagan Land, Nixon Land, from before the storm. I, I hope he's also an owner of a fast charging cable uh, for his phone. We're going to find out. Yeah. All right, so, so wait, where are you right now? Are you in Cuba? I am in Cuba. I am right. killing members of the Cuban military in order to yeah. get into this building and get our nukes back. Those are the slowest traces I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, they, uh, I am playing on Recruit, to be fair. Yeah. Because I'm more interested in just burning us through the story than any kind of challenge. Yeah, of course. Well, and this is something that really strikes me about this particular Call of Duty game, is that it's very boring. Um, a lot of the gameplay elements of it, as, as thrilling and as bizarre as the story is, um, and kind of this paranoid, like, reactionary fantasy, like, the actual gameplay of it is not very terribly no. interesting. This is the thing, right? Like, um, paranoid, like, paranoid right-wing, like, agitprop like this should at least be more fun. Um, and it just isn't. Like, this is, like, I'm, I'm somebody who, like, Red Dawn has toxic, ridiculous politics. Red Dawn is a hell of a movie. Right. Um, and that's kind of, like, where this game, like, what I, like, one of the many places it completely falls apart is it kind of can't even do what it's setting out to do. It can't even do it well. Um, it just ends up being really flat and starts to turn into, I don't know, the equivalent of like those really like C-tier uh, conservative, like the people, the wannabe Tom Clancy's and shit, yeah. uh, who write just like increasingly preposterous uh, like alt history fiction um, that's, you know, it, 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 it makes you realize like as bad as Tom Clancy is, his better books at least have some competency in storytelling and like plotting. Your your Brad Forbes, right? Yeah. Your uh, like I think about like every every conservative pundit now has their own like Tom Clancy style fiction book that's usually pretty terrible, right? Like Glenn Beck. Yeah, Riley kind of kicked them. off the uh, trend with that, right? With his uh, Killing series. Well, those are at least purport to be history books, but uh, like all uh, of them, because some of those titles are pretty fucking wild, or it's like. Yeah, they're very, I mean, they're very, like, loose and fast and written, like, fiction works, but they're purport to be history books. Uh, but now I'm thinking more like, uh, like, Ben Shapiro, for example, has a thriller that he has written. You're kidding. No. No, oh, you should really check fuck. it out. It's, it's quite amazing. I gotta read that. Shit. Oh, yeah. no. Somebody steal me of that book. Uh, but one of the main characters is a... A like a, it's like the youngest four star general in American history that is in Oh really? Like a young prodigy? Um He says I think he's watching us, he said Howard Hunt. Um uh, which I don't understand that reference right now, but Rick I'm sure when you get back you will tell us. Um I know that it rings a bell. The Watergate burglar? As I, oh, as I he, he wrote, uh, Howard Hunt, who was a Watergate burglar, wrote thrillers. That's what he's referring to. Oh, he did to. not. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, he did. He, he wrote thrillers where he was kind of lionizing himself and his actions, uh, if I recall correctly. So this is, so I was talking about this um, on Through the Head with uh, my co-host Troy, because we, we, we went back and we watched All the President's Men. And we were both struck by how the real tragedy of all the president's men is all these good conservatives just get swept up in this thing and totally get abandoned by Nixon. That's the real sin, is that, like, all these totally decent dudes uh, get totally stabbed in the back by the guy who led them into this shit. Um, and it got me, like, I started looking at what happened to a lot of the people who were featured in all the president's men. It's not that bad, right? Like most of the people who were, you know, in that movie talking about, oh, this is probably ruined my life, end up having perfectly, you know, terrific careers in politics uh, and law. Yep. Yep. Uh, he brings up, uh, he also brings up William F. Buckley as a pundit who wrote uh, thrillers that were, were not super well received. Uh, well, he was... Boy, the, the myth of Buckley as an engaging writer 
um, yeah. is one of the things that fucking perplexes me to this day. Like, I get I get the Hitchens adoration, um, but like, I've never read anything in Buckley's uh, that is is particularly struck me. Um, you know, it's funny. I was watching I was watching Firing Line on YouTube yesterday. <laughs> Always a good time. And I was watching I was watching like Hitchens, uh, like super lefty early Hitchens. Yeah, of course. Uh, like super like Marxist Hitchens uh, on an early uh, like a late episode of Firing Line, uh, or just destroying a guy, of course. Um, he <laughs> Rick says he's itching to get into this conversation. Um, uh, but yeah, there, we make a lot of Buckley, right? Uh, there's there is this great myth around that particular character, and people don't know who he is. Um, can you prime primer the audience on William F. Buckley, founder of the National Review? Uh, sort of in in a weird way, in his sort of raconteurish aspirations, uh, was almost like a right wing uh, Hefner in terms of a man of letters, uh, sort of a, a dilettante in his interests, but also uh, creates the National Review, which becomes sort of the official mouthpiece for the post-Goldwater conservative movement in some ways. And I think the, the famous quote associated with him is, uh, you know, the purpose of the National Review is to, to stand athwart history and yell stop. And of course, that, that's a quote you hear a lot of times ripped from context. Um, but in the context in which that quote exists, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the, the tide of history that he's yelling stop at is desegregation, uh, you know, and, and the expansion of, uh, of, of the welfare state. So, like, Buckley gets portrayed as this uh, almost pseudo-libertarian hero, I think, where he's just a man of ideas and just has this really... Uh, you know, stark vision of freedom, but a lot of times if you look at his work, um, he's, a, he's a pretty doctrinaire conservative uh, by a lot of standards, but the other thing is he had this reputation of being very funny. Uh, I think in his uh, one, in, in a tribute Reagan, I think, made to Buckley, talks about how uh, he showed people the, the rich green uplands of, uh, of, of laughter um, that you could you could enjoy under, under in a free society, and the notion of, of holding out Buckley in the National Review as like, you know, this is kind of fun and free thought uh, you can have under American capitalism is pretty laughable if you go back and you look at a lot of the output uh, from from that magazine. And if you would like, if you're searching for a modern day analog, do you think like Tucker Carlson? Do you think that that's fair? Uh, I think I think that's fair in some ways. I think the thing is Buckley. So Buckley was also a pretty money dude. Uh, well, so is Carl. So, so, so is Tucker Carlson. for that matter. Yeah. But the difference is Buckley wanted you to know that Buckley was very patrician in his uh, in, in his affect. Right. He had Tucker, he had a distinct voice and like accent that was pure affectation. Like nobody talks this way. Right. Right. Um. Whereas I think I think Tucker definitely does want to like cosplay uh, as sort of a very traditional, just Gary Cooper esque uh, traditional American man. Right. He doesn't want you to know about the trust fund. Right. And there's a lot of great uh, William Buckley stuff in Rick Perlstein's book about Barry Goldwater before the storm. Um, really, it, it's really interesting to 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 like read Rick's books because they kind of walk you through this history of the conservative movement because you have to understand that like hang on Rick's Rick's tagging back in he oh. can't stand we're, we're talking about Rick Rick's coming back I in I can't stand it man I can't freaking stand it uh and now I don't have my headphones on because my wife said she like much more enjoys like actually hearing like a little bit more of the conversation than just my yak lovely uh, this will come in handy although, get on the camera feed spell uh, perfect although actually Actually, I'm not getting the sound unless I put it in my headphones. That's fine. Okay. Well, you know, um, your wife will be able to watch the uh, the stream afterwards. This will be our Yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm sure she'll be riveted. Um, <laughs> so I actually don't. I have the stream on, and just maybe this will be better for my battery. Uh, I have the stream on my computer. Sorry, guys. I feel like I missed a lot of great stuff. Um, but, yeah, I wrote an article in the... the um, the New York Times uh, magazine called I Thought I Understood the Right or something like that, but then came Trump. 
and it was a little bit of a revision of my own work in which I, I kind of bought the right wing's own um, narrative about itself that in order to kind of succeed in politics, they had to kind of hive off their kind of uglier, dirtier, nastier, more racist elements, but that, you know, and which William was Buckley something was, that Buckley was famous for, right? Yeah, Apparently. that was his whole project. He said the whole point of National Review is to create sort of a conservative uh, conservative ideology that politicians can adapt without embarrassment. But, you know, I kind of went through some of the embarrassing stuff that, you know, um, was going on at the same time. And um, there's some really good scholarship going on about that stuff now. If you read what, you know, National Review was saying about decolonization in Africa, and you read the, the, the magazine of the White Citizens Council, you know, the racist Southern group that was organized that, you know, terrorized civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement in the South, it's, it's pretty much identical, right? So it's myth that there was kind of this, you know, respectable, you know, kind of national review movement and this kind of, um, per this, this, this ugly, nasty part that they purged is really harder to sustain, especially the more, um, kind of direct primary sources we look at about how they were kind of talking when they, you know, were just among themselves and what their kind of actual strategies were. It does feel like a recurring motif in conservative politics and thinking as well, this notion that uh, once again things seem to have gotten out of hand, that it was always the last generation's conservatives who knew where to draw the line, and then the crazies got a hold of it. Uh, but every new generation throws up new, new crazies. Oh my god, it's so, it, that, that whole discourse, discourse is so fascinating. In, in Goldwater's era, you know, Gold, Goldwater is crazy, literally crazy. You know, he's going to get us in a nuclear war. He completely abandoned, you know, everything accomplished by modern society. But, you know, Robert Taft, you know, the conservative leader who came before Goldwater, who you know, died in the early 1950s, he was this, you know, real conservative, and he was a respectable conservative. And then in the 1970s, it was, you know, these, Reagan, these people around Nixon are crazy, but that Reagan guy, that, that Goldwater guy sure is civilized, you know. And you just you see it over and over again, and, and then you saw, you know, like now you see kind of Reagan celebrating you know, this kind of, you know, apogee of, of, of uh, respectable conservatism, you know. Um, uh, but you know, I deconstruct that a little bit in my Reagan land book. What are you doing there, by the way? What am I doing in Cuba? Yeah, I'm trying to. They've got the the nuke here. Uh, that the nuke that was stolen and smuggled in, so now we are trying to recover the nuke. So you don't even really need a story, it's just like, just like shoot stuff and get them a weapon. Basically, yeah. Uh, Rick, you are ready to uh, creatively direct a Call of Duty. Yeah, basically, um, yeah, you got it. That is the... I expected it to be a little more impressive than that. That is the insight I think the Call of Duty developers have had uh, repeatedly, is that you... They used to worry a bit more about table setting and like a little bit of cohesion, and increasingly these games are just um, hallucinations of uh, like war fantasies. Right. So just so it's kind of like a horror movie. No matter you know what the kind of backstory is, the purge or whatever, it's basically a part uh, a, a story about how to get out of the house without getting killed. Correct. Um, it's going to be. Well, I, if I, is there any more narrative that? So we're getting yes. there because I'm demanding Matthew show me the bad ending, which he says is. We uh, can. I mean, we we pretty much got our lock on Cuba. We can jump. Yeah. to We can get to like the weird stuff now, if that's where we want to go. Okay. Let's I do love that. the weird stuff. All right. So at the end of this mission, you uh you you find out that the new you find the nuke, but then you that is when you realize the team realizes can like. Can I, can I interrupt you as, a, as someone who's not a gamer? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. It, like took a lot of work and skill to get to the next level. And here you're just kind of bopping around. Well, I've also, I've also, because I'm trying to just facilitate us having a conversation. I mean, Call of Duties aren't that tough. Uh, I've already, I've already run through it once uh, because I knew that we were going to have this conversation. So because I've played through it once and beaten it, I am now able to just jump to whatever level I want to go to. Oh, okay. I thought you had to like kill Boss Hog or something like that. Uh, big boss. Or big boss. Oh yeah. Metal. Is that a metal? Oh my Gear god. Reference we need to do Rick Metal Gear with Rick Prolstein. That would be play. Uh, you uh, pay me for that. <laughs> fair. Okay. So well, you know a lot about your wingnut history. Good for you. Uh, oh um, yeah. I so 
I, my AP US history teacher described himself before I knew what a red flag this was, described himself as a Goldwater conservative. Oh, nice. And like made available to us uh, many fine uh, rags, uh, commentary, uh, the National mm. Review, and the New Republic back when it was being run right. by Even a the liberal New Republic. The liberal New Republic that just like, you know, for the wanted kids, to would, genocide Palestinians. Some, you know, like they would endorse some like, oh, we need to invade, you know, uh, we need to invade, uh, you know, uh, El Salvador to take over from the commies. And then the Reagan people would say, even the New Republic yep. you know, says we should invade South America, South Central America. So, yeah, so I definitely went through my phase of trying to be open minded about this shit uh, and got pretty far down into like never bought into it. But I, I tried to understand the intellectual like groundings of the movement. And then I started to increasingly realize that it was kind of always a self-justifying exercise. Well, you, you, you got there about, uh, you know, like much quicker than I did. <laughs> well, I was I was smart enough to confine that to a, a five paragraph essay, uh, like my sophomore year of high school. I didn't I didn't make the leap to be like you know what I need to do I need to write a tome. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've made it pay. Um. All right. So at the end, of, we find that nuke at the end of that last mission. We uh, and as you are escaping Cuba, the character of Bell, who you've been playing at as through most of the game, is injured. Right, and now, now we're getting the twist. Okay, so I'm gonna charge again, and I'm just gonna listen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, that was a goddamn fiasco. You go in with the intel you have, not the intel you want. We paid the fucking piper down there. You think this is Bell's fault? I don't know whose fault it is. I just know that Perseus doesn't have a single fucking nuke. He's got dozens. Millions of people are gonna die, and the United States will take the blame. You need to find out where he's planning to broadcast the activation signal. Are we gonna pull? Black sounds so much like Reagan. He does. It's not him though. It's freaking me out. Yeah. It's like close, but it's not quite there. All right. So you remember how you were talking about how the Vietnam sequence in this game it was was kind of weird earlier? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and like it seemed like you're being Manchurian candidated. Like, okay. Oh, here we go. Come on, a little further. Okay. So we're back here. Yep. After you, after being injured in Cuba, they bring Bell back to the CIA holding facility, wherever it is. Get the gurney. And we are going to do the black pill ending for those on the stream who are excited to see it. <laughs> I am so excited. Bell. Okay, so the Black Ops fam is helping you. I feel like I owe you. <sighs> Bloody hell. I'm going to lose a lot more than Lazar if we don't execute this next move correctly. We need you to hang in there for one more assignment. I'm counting on you again, Bell. Sims, get the dosages ready. All of them. Adler, stop wasting our valuable time. They're of no use to us anymore. Stay alert, Bell. You're the key to stopping the Perseus. You always have been. No more half-assed. We're doing an interest of rebel injection. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Injecting directly into the brain could provoke seizures, or worse. Damn. The oh, eyes no. Are you sure about this, Doctor? Oh, it's oh, happening. Here, here we go. Oh. oh, I didn't need this. Yep. Oh, no. Memory should begin almost immediately. Bell, listen to me. I need you to remember. Think back to our time in Vietnam one more time. We need to finish what we started. We had a job. Is Bell about to astrally project to the Vietnam War? It's even better than that. Think, Bell. <laughs> Perseus. Do you remember coming face to face with Perseus in Vietnam? EKG is spiking. Shit. Heart rate's off the charts. I need you to relax and focus, Bell. Your helicopter crashed. You made your way through the jungle. 
alone. You found a bunker. Do you remember the bunker, Bell? Wait, I don't remember you this. You need to know what's inside that bunker. You're not supposed to. So it's a different memory of the helicopter crash? Correct. Where is lying to you? Do not trust him. Do not listen to Abler. He is lying to you. He is lying to you. Do not trust Abler. I believe you, Perseus. During a mission to investigate reports of a Soviet bunker, your chopper was hit by ground fire. According to your debrief, you woke up in the middle of a firefight. Yeah, because supposedly Bell is the only one who has seen Perseus's face. Saw his face in this bunker in Vietnam. And so they're trying to make him recover that memory. You ran forward and picked up an M16. And I mean an MP5, but whatever. Yeah. Okay, so your helicopter just crash landed by an NDA stronghold. Right, of course. Like you do. Also, we were talking a little bit about this. I just hate how, um, and I like I know why it is this way, and that's fine. But like, I do hate how generic and interchangeable the gun feel is now. Yeah, yeah. Like all the weapons. The Vietnam feel era M16 full auto should not be that's like just you. going tap 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 until people are down. But whatever. Wait, you just did you just run into apocalypse now? Yes. Could you have gone to the right? I could have, but I chose to go to the left because I'm not doing okay. what the CIA is telling me. The zip line nearby was the best way back. You wanted to get to that bunker as soon as possible. But you're not. Well, Turn back and use the zip line to reach the bunker. Seeing a firefight, you ready to M16. This is the most interesting two minutes I've seen of this game. This is the 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 last act of it. This little bit right here is the only like kind of interesting part of the whole thing. I actually kind of like this little this bit that we're going through now. Um, this that, is, see, this is like, uh, oh, what the hell is it, um... Jacob's Ladder? No, I was thinking Call of Juarez, uh, where, like, the narration changes. Changes, out. changes as you're playing, yeah. You need to get stabbed in the back. Well, I mean, I've already been Great stabbed Abrams has this thing won, uh, but sadly, we're about to be betrayed by the libs. So I'm the worst. I'm the worst switcher ever because I was like using the um, power cord that doesn't work. <laughs> I'm already up about four percent. Oh, you're using yeah. It was the you got to use that up. that brand power cord. I screwed up everything. Uh, you're you're doing fine. Thank people you. people have loved it. Oh, okay. and I think I, mean, I think you've like, sold at least like, like five copies. Movie, like, you know, the goofy, like, clueless uncle guy. So, Matt, are we gonna get to the, the thing with the, the, the KGB sector video? Where he, like, you know, says the Soviet Union is... No, like, okay, so that was just marketing. That was just marketing. That was just marketing. There's That that yeah. stuff is not it's really... It's not as interesting as that. Yeah, it's not as interesting as that. Yeah. Um, I do think, because I, I was so happy that you sent me that email earlier today where you saw that you'd yeah. seen that Active Measures video, because it was, there was a minor controversy about it, kind of, um, when it had popped, when it had, like, come up, because people watched that and obviously were very upset, uh, I think. People were upset that the guy they had in the video was the present-day 
kind of hero on the right of kind of the alt right kind of world. Exactly, like this, you know, this cultural Marxist. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, especially because it's dropping in the middle of a summer of uh, protests right. against police shootings, and so again, like the the message in that marketing is yeah. like, oh, all like the unraveling yeah, of being on the left is all basically a plot by the enemy. Yeah, yeah, like these people aren't actually out there because of police violence. They're they're there because they're dupes. Yeah, they're all useful idiots, right? So, in other words, if, this is a, this is another good example of why. It's Theory thinking fail, right? It's like, oh, this game must be kind of an agent of that kind of thinking. But it was just like they just found some sort of cool Soviet sounding video that, like, you know, kind of you know, caused a little buzz for the game. And, yeah. You know, they never intended that sort of thing. It was probably bad for them. Well, here's the thing, though, because Call of Duty has a long history of creating controversies, controversies that with the with the aim of like making people pay attention to the game. So this is the video game thing. Yeah. So like the the most famous one is there was a mission in an earlier game where um, you. Oh, here. All right, so this is the reveal. We're playing through the reveal. Oh, this is like this is like a uh, okay. act to you. They strap them down and brainwash them. Yep. Oh man, that's very 1970s conspiracy movie. Oh, which is a very left wing genre, of course. The VC were on the ground. I don't hate this. Or Clockwork Orange. You ready your bow to take them out silently? That Clockwork yeah, so Orange. So now you're in Rambo. Yep. But same map. But now you're doing Rambo. Yep. Oh yeah, flaming arrow. We get to win this time, by the way, Matt. Oh, we always win. It's America. Well, actually, so no. Talking about the whole the whole obsession of Reagan with hostages. I mean, the idea that America always rescues these hostages was a big part of his story long before the hostage crisis in Iran. And he, of course, you know, from the original bad guy, really was here the years of Vietnam, taking over the war, kind of falling through the lens of you know, this whole very kind of masculine kind of hero in So how much, um, I remember... This is the dumbest weapon ever. It is, it, it, this does not seem like the weapon you want in a Kalashnikov fight. Yeah. Wait, this okay, hold evade, on. Evade, evade getting shot, man. That's really... Oh, oh, the cone, the little straw cone hat. The path split nice. here, room. So he took the right one, not the trail to the left. But you're going to the left because there's the dark room. It's all the bits and pieces from your little safe house. Yeah. Again, I'm not doing oh, what the oh, CIA's telling us. That's Colonel Kurtz is in there, right? That's a little... The little Buddhist temple. Yep. The horror. <laughs> the horror. The it's horror. It's more like the it's more like the banale, though, isn't it? People are pointing out this is just totally cribbing Stanley Parable. Like that. Yes, it hundred percent is. Just wait, folks. It's gonna crib some more from some other games you may have played. <laughs> so. This is not, this is far from the, the apogee of the video game creating art. This is not the state of the art, is what you're saying. No, I think one of the odd things about this series is also that it is, um, it's a very popular multiplayer game where people are playing this competitively. And on that front, Call of Duty is frequently regarded as kind of, uh, you know, sort of best in class. And there's even, like, Evidence that most people who buy Call of Duty never touch this stuff. Um, right. That's the game, the, 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 the firefight. So, is, um, is it, are Call of Duty games played uh, in arenas for money? Yeah, they, they oh, yeah. are. They're, um, Activision has invested a lot of money in creating a professional league for Call of Duty. Uh, are you, uh, training? No, I'm too old. We're, like, I'm way too old to do that. Are you kidding me? 
Yeah, you gotta be able to stay up really late, and you gotta be able to... Matt, did you just cower through the napalm strike so we couldn't see oh, the, I'm... the spectacle? I'm so sorry, I, I did. I love the spell of smell of napalm in the morning. You know, one day this war's gonna end. I can't believe you left the lens cap on the opening shot of I'm so uh, sorry. Apocalypse Now. <laughs> sorry, we're about to go through some Jacob's Ladder, so it's gonna be okay. When I say it's safe to surf this beach, it's safe to surf this beach. Oh, wow, that got clean. What? You're still kind of in the jungle? Underneath, is this like underneath? No, this is all like in his his head. He's being... He's in his head. Okay. Yeah. This, We're in the landscape like, um, of Bell's memories. This looks like that Jordan Steele movie. Yeah. It's a rabbit. That's it, Bell. That's what you were looking for. Perseus was in there. Rabbit. But you're no longer following that mission. Defiance, Rob. Always defiance. No dance. Too sure, no dance. Scenario one. Bell, we've got a job to do. I wouldn't advise that. I didn't ask. So to your debrief. You woke up in the middle of a firefight. The crash survivors were defending against a PC attack. You readied a grenade launcher and charged ahead. Hello again. Wait, hold on. Are you shooting American troops now? Oh, you've got an eye, don't you? Things keep changing, yes. Okay. Those are actually all Adlers. Those are all Robert Redfords. And oh, so you really? The guns aren't very realistic. Yeah, the the game feel the way Call of Duty feels now is not super great. So they used to be a little bit more convincing in terms of their modeling of firearms, but uh, most people play these on uh, consoles with controllers, and so there's a lot of things to make it more about uh not like you know gun has real recoil etc um but that's tough to model to, to counterbalance with a controller and so call of duty i'm sorry yeah call of duty games just tend to get rid of as much recoil as possible you know my xr 2600 didn't have recoil and i did just fine so <laughs> Shut up, Grandpa. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to so get us through the back, next... How come you were back to the temple, or was that a different temple? It was... No, he keeps replaying the same scenario over and over again, because I won't give him what he wants. What does he want? He wants uh, Perseus's identification, and, like, where Perseus is. And I'm not... Gonna... Is one person. The is in the oh, look, it's Robert Redford. Go. Oh, that's Kurt. Wow, that's, like... They made a the, the, the peasants made him like a memorial of the worship, right? Yep. Oh my god. Oh, wait, so now you're finally doing the zipline? Yeah, because it won't let me go the other way. When the Playboy bunny is coming in? No, Bell. God, what a, the, the director's cut is such a weird experience. Why is? <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. The what did they call it? Re, uh, redo. Redux. Redux. Yeah. It was worth. Yeah, it, it like, did not help. Yeah, tunnel. You, right. Okay, you pulled out your sidearm and flashlight. I was wondering if we were gonna get through this whole thing without some sort of coochie tunnel system. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 
reference. But wait, I'm getting a strange twist coming up. Those the aliens? Those were zombies. Oh. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Because the man size safe from Cheney's office. <laughs> I, when I, one of the things that happened when I was offline, I saw an awesome uh, IBM desktop PC. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the old school, like... Green screen. Clark, give Bell another injection. Do it now! Man, they just keep feeding this poor guy horse tranquilizers. Yep. So yeah, this is kind of like uh, Jason Bourne stuff. Yes, very much so. What was that? What was that Mel Gibson movie where he's like a MK Cons Ultra conspiracy. conspiracy theory? Conspiracy theory, yeah. Yeah, I remember it being all right. Back when conspiracy theories were kind of fun in the nineties. Innocent times. Innocent times. There's your Jacob's Ladder reference. So and of course the. Another kind of, you know, to pull the lens back on the Cold War stuff, I mean, the CIA was just always really, really bad at what it did. Yes. You know? That's the like something the Shah, that's really, yeah. The Shah will be in power forever, you know, uh, um, you know, there's going to be a long war in the Middle East in 1967, you know. Um, you know, there's a really good um, new book, uh, what is it called? I'm looking one up here. I heard an interview with the author on um, Fresh air, and it's about what the, the formation of the CIA after World War II, and they just kept on like basically parachuting people in, you know, to Europe, like behind, you know, in Poland, you know, to go undercover, and they would always just end up dying and end up killing lots of people, you know, killing their own guys, and it was just like the idea that the CIA was kind of, you know, part of the part of the American left conspiracy theory about the CIA is that they have this kind of ruthless competence to control everything. And you know they've never been able to control anything. Right. The real the real truth is that they're complete screw ups and they burn all the files. Yeah, and that's where the secrecy comes from. It's just basically covering up their mistakes. Yep. Right, now he's doing go. good in Vietnam. The radio, radio, Vietnam radio guy. The Robin Williams, yeah. <laughs> Are they really Except running this again? I think this is the last one. Well, you've got a job to do. It's a cool conceit, but I swear to God, if you're falling out of the helicopter again, I'm yeah. lose my mind. It's the last. This is the last one. If I right, this is the last one. Yeah, this is the last run through. Skip ahead. Next. Time. And he. Adler oh, is also oh, bored. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, so now he's just fast forwarding your recovered memory. Bell, go into the bunker. Oh. This is terrific. Tell me about Perseus. What happened in the bunker? Bell, Perseus. But no. And then eventually, yeah, he'll force you into the, the red door. And the green door. <laughs> Got the deep cut right there. Yep. All right, here you go. And here we go. Does Alexander Haig come back? No, but we will get a little bit of Reagan at the end. The very, very Wait, end. now we're... You're the only one who knows what Perseus is. Are, do we, are we doing Evangelion now? Yes, we are. We are, in fact. Comrades, the United States and its allies slowly consume that which is dear to us. Our leaders continue to weaken under this threat. It is the moral duty of Perseus to act when they will not. 
Okay. Soon we will possess an American nuclear bomb. The key to unlocking their entire green light arsenal. Once we control the green light arsenal, we will detonate them all from the safety of Solovetsky. So you remember the, the 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 airstrip in Turkey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bell was in the car. He was the one of the guys that got shot. Oh. So wait, did Bell go on any of these missions throughout this game? A couple of them, yes. Okay. But, but a lot of it's just been implanted memories. <laughs> I like a light, lighting effect. I don't know if there you go. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Is that the Little flashing of the screen just on your face, or...? Oh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I like that. John Carpenter movie. Bell. They call you Bell because they were ringing the bell over and over again during the interrogation. Oh my god. And Hold they, door. Hold door. Yes. And they even have a, uh, a would you kindly because we've got a job to do is your trigger phrase. So that's why Adler oh, so keeps saying it. In Canada thing. Yep. Would, yes. would you like to play a little solitaire? Yep. All right, so there's only one more mission left. And it's, it's up to Bell to decide what they want to do now that they have discovered this about themselves. Oh, this makes my beard look giant. They're coming too. Bell, no more fucking around. What oh, I like how it's so redacted. Where is he? You're disoriented, Bell. We'll explain everything later. Right now, we need to help each other. We gave you a second chance when you were shit out of luck. Now, we just want some assistance in return. Bell, you were one of Perseus's agents. His associate, Arash Kardavar, turned on you at the airstrip in Turkey. Left you for dead. Does this happen if you if you get the good ending goal, or is this only revealed to you if you are that defiant? Um, I think this is revealed. This is revealed to you regardless. The the okay. branching paths for the good and bad ending are coming up here in a moment. They'll be pretty obvious. Here's what you don't know. Perseus won't be there. None of these hired guns are going to leave Duva alive. Is that a members only windbreaker? Those are very big in the eighties. Yep. Don't have bodies in the forest. We will move the Wait, are, are we in the end of the Sopranos at this point? <laughs> Essentially, yes. You get, you're gonna kill Tony at the very end? Spoiler, sorry, spoilers. Where <laughs> are they? I was, I was shocked that they let a Call of Duty out of the gates with the ending that I uh, put in, is what I will say. Wow, so this guy killed you because he was jealous that Perseus thought you were cool. Yep. That's the, the whole motivation for how they picked you up and decided to reprogram you. Yes. It's okay if I've lost the thread. Yeah, it's... I've completely lost the thread, it's okay. so... A multi is Falcon or something. The CIA reinvented you, though. We needed to give you a new identity. In the end, no specific background really stuck with you. You resisted everything we tried, so this ends the mystery. Oh, uh, that's a very funny. So you, they, they call back to this moment where you fill out bits and pieces of your redacted personnel file at the beginning when you create of the your game. character. Yep. The bigger challenge was remembering. The CIA's MK Ultra program used Atlas missions in Vietnam as a template. I love that this idea that the CIA is okay. Ultra okay. was in the fifties and right. Vietnam was in the sixties. And that, and that it was successful, right? That they were successful yeah. enough to be able to they reprogram did, they did someone. They succeed in creating mind control. Yeah. Yeah. So those prostitutes didn't die for no, no, Are for nothing. Clean, Interrogation didn't work with you, but 
Thanks to MK Ultra's research, we had a backup plan. If you believed you were someone else, we could lead you to a place where you'd give everything up. I don't think so. You're still holding Big same, Bell. Yeah. Are gonna get it out of you. Yeah, that's how I felt. Honestly. Got a job to do. Bell, we've got Come a job. Got a job. Come on. Got a job to do. Got a job to do. Okay, so that's the trigger phrase. Yep. Didn't get us everything we needed. Your innermost secrets were always locked behind a door. Bell, I realize you probably hate us right now. What we've done to you. I just need you to fully understand. So all this brainwashing stuff is huge. Right now is part of American Cold War popular culture and everything it's since all comes out of the Korean War thing. This fear that co the Korean War prisoners of war have been brainwashed by the Chinese. It was a huge, huge, huge issue in the fifties. So tell me. There's remnants of it in, in a lot of conspiracy theories to this day, right? Like, I, I want to say, I remember, I want to say there's, like, conspiracy theory around J, uh, RFK being killed, that, like, Sirhan Sirhan was, like, found to be suggestible and possibly acting under um, conditioning. And it was... It was Patty Hearst's defense, essentially, during her trial. And I'm going to lie, because fuck them. Washington on the line. Everyone else gear up. We're leaving now. I love this, by the way. Man, I'm going to find you this BBC uh, a documentary about Ronald Reagan's prisoner of war film. Yeah, I want to see that. It's really amazing. So after all of that, they're going to take you with them to go do the rest of this mission? That is wild. Yeah, but no, I'm going to call the Russians and let them know that we're coming. Um, so is that film sort of the origin of Reagan's obsession with like hostages and like uh, or is that a no I think that that, that that probably comes from you know the, the kind of boys adventure stories that he would read that had a huge impact on kind of his identity for me to this facility in the Soviet Republic of Ukraine the Duga radar array oh of course we can we gotta see this thing Big improvement over their old missile defense tech. It uses a lot of juice. Could be used to broadcast any kind All right. of Are you guys ready for nation codes to <laughs> something a little wild? Where exactly is it? It hasn't been wild yet. About sixty miles north of Kiev. For a Call of Duty game, I thought this was this particular ending was pretty interesting. So I've set them up, I've called the Soviets, I called Perseus ahead. Uh, we're not going to where the bomb actually is. Right, you're going straight into an ambush. Going, leading the Americans straight into an ambush. Bell came through for us in the nick of time. I never doubted it. <laughs> yeah, I just love the idea that they would take this brainwashed soldier with them on the last mission. They would let them up off the gurney, right? Yeah. The same guy that that popped that poor Iranian kid on the roof in Amsterdam is is gonna let or is gonna let Bell go. And this is fairly brief. You sure you're not forgetting something, Bell? There's nothing here. This can't be the right place. We didn't see anything on our side either. I knew it! Bell fucking lied to us! That true, Bell? You pull us out to the middle of nowhere, Russia, so Perseus can detonate those nukes? Why, did they just blow up an RPG at your feet? They did, but it's okay. I have a video game character, so I survived. Oh, is that Perseus coming to thank you? Oh, this is incredible. Nice. Very grim ending. Wow. You just brutally gunned down your friends. 
Correct. Ugh. But they weren't really your friends. They had brainwashed me. So this is a pro cami uh, game. Well, this is an optional ending. Uh, so you've got to kind of choose. <laughs> you have to choose to do this. Are there any of them that end with mushroom clouds? Oh, we're getting there. Oh, that's all right. No, no. No, I had a feeling we were gonna we were gonna get a new before this ended. No oh, man, Mason's not gonna be talking so much shit now. I can't remember which one Mason is. Oh no, Mason's the other agent. He's the he's the agent in some side missions. You right. play Mason in a bunch of uh, memories from other ops. So you just killed... Well, it wouldn't be a Call of Duty character without a, a game without a PvE character getting brutally murdered. Yep. So the only one left is Robert Redford. Yeah, motherfucker. Glad to see you still care. Mind giving me away. Of course. Yeah, because it's Call of Duty. This is a frequent trope in Call of Duty games. It's a struggle with a weapon where you have to repeatedly push a button. <laughs> so exploitative. Yes. I think, like, exploitation film as the background and the inspiration yeah, for one of these games is, at, like, absolutely apt. I'm not entirely clear why he was wearing a gas mask, but... Solovetsky, stand by for the detonation order. I think you deserve this one, comrade. The West falls today, gentlemen. Hmm. The West. I wish we could return to Solovetsky to watch it all unfold, but that chapter is closed now. Oh, now it's. We begin the next one together. Equal time. <laughs> They'll never stop making Call of Duty. <laughs> After all this time, they still believe I'm Perseus. So there's no in-app purchases? Oh, there are. Perseus could ever be an individual working alone. Oh, nice bloody footprint. That's a nice touch. We'll need a new home now. The Central Committee will be more surprised than the CIA. Yeah, rogue elements. We made the best choice for the future of our homeland. Hmm. Yeah, for humanity, their eyes will be as cloudy. The theory is that there will be no oh. second strike on the back of this, <laughs> right? Yeah, We're, especially with Reagan in office. All right, well, so here another, 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 another Alpha Squad took Reagan out. Well, no nope. capitation strike. Here we oh. go. Oh. My God, how many green light nukes did he detonate? All of them. Does anyone know the bombs were ours? Materials related to Operation Greenlight were anonymously released an hour ago. Presumably the New York Times. Perseus. Calls are beginning to come in from across the globe. That son of a bitch. You and Vice President Bush are to be moved to secure locations immediately. I want any business related to this thing erased forever. Everything. Can you make that happen? Of course. It's already begun. So Matt, like when I when I was promoting this, everyone who saw the uh, the trailer mentioned the Saturday Night Live sketch with Phil Hartman. Yeah, being the one where he's engineering the conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. where he's the hyper competent Reagan. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that that's is... that's really interesting that we had that idea of him and that it persists to this day, right? 
Um, well, well, that, that, which that vision do you mean? The hyper competent. That sketch, that sketch was really bad news because, you know, the joke is, of course, he's not competent, right? So if he's not competent, he can't be in control of everything. He must not have any responsibility for a contra. So that right. sketch ends up kind of like, like playing into the White House narrative. Ooh. But there's this, but there's this vision on like what I think is really interesting about this game and this particular like characterization of him is because he is to, he is portrayed as this hyper competent leader, right? Um, and that that is the myth of his, yeah stalwart moral always do what was what right. Do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that is the version of him that persists, I think, in the mind of a lot of conservative Americans to this day. Um, and it's not, it's not that it's not just not true, it's that it's much more complicated than that, because he was a human and humans are complicated. And that the idea that returning to uh, Reagan's world is a good thing for us to do is also, like, just bizarre, because there are so well, many I mean, people... If, if you just kind of reviewed the record of what Iran-Contra did, you know, and didn't put Reagan's name behind it, the fact that they traded arms for hostages... And then they would just take more hostages. I mean, they totally played in the shop, yep. you know? I mean, it's just astonishing. On its own terms, it failed so profoundly. Yep. So you've now, you've seen what the gamers are doing. Uh, what do you make of Call of Duty, Rick? Um, I think that it's a little too kind of cartoonish and banal to be worrisome. I That's thought a good that, take. that 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 trailer, you know, um, you know, oh, don't worry about the law, you know, we're fighting for freedom was really malign and scary. But I just don't think that the, the game actually kind of carries it through. It's just a bunch of you know, bang bang. And I think I think that's kind of where Call of Duty is now is that it comes in with all it comes in and it gen, gens up these controversies and makes these big makes people afraid kind of before its release um and then you get to play it and there's not a whole lot to it right <laughs> yeah <Wrong. coughs> yeah a little anticlimactic yeah and I, I think it it is so divorced from any even one of the things i found really odd about this is um I thought it would tie more into late Cold War politics. Like if you if you look at this gallery of images, places you go, things you do in this game, you think it's going to tie into the historical moment, but it's an odd thing. It's like it it takes imagery from the Cold War, mm -hmm. but then imagines a completely different reality around the camera, if you will. Right. Um, and that's what you play. Yeah, it's well, this. Go ahead. Yeah, what, what were you going to say? No, no, you go, you go ahead. You're, you're, you're the guest. Well, I mean, I, I, I think um, it has enormous potential, right? I mean, whether, you know, it's some annoying kind of right-wing, you know, sort of culture creator or someone with a little bit more sophisticated, you know, kind of moral, moral vision, I think that the genre has an enormous potential but i think there's just so much kind of money involved the idea that you could go to a, i don't know anything about this world you know but it seems like you need to go to some very interesting places uh but it seems like these are very big budget productions i mean there is there a world of kind of independent video games at this kind of level of uh technical accomplishments that are kind of doing interesting things narratively at this level of so like the the kind of spectacle you see here is very expensive to produce right. and so to create what you just saw requires something that's pretty far from independent you need a big studio uh behind yeah. that millions of dollars um, hundreds of hours of labor yeah music you know yeah and but there are there is an independent video game scene that is making wonderful vibrant and interesting media um, it is not at the level of spectacle that this is, but it, but in many ways that I, I think that the spectacle of a Call of Duty game also limits it in certain yeah. ways because we are so there. There's expectations tied around this thing, 
Um, I mean, yeah, on the level of kind of the psyche, it's pretty low, lowest common denominator stuff, I'm afraid to say. Right. Yeah, there's no, okay there's no Samuel game. Fuller of video well, games to some extent. Well, so what I was thinking is, you know, in, in, in Reagan land, you know, one of the things that was going on politically was, you know, Vietnam had happened, right? It was, uh, you know, this great national failure, but uh, there was a very... I think as a person coming from the left, salutary kind of reckoning with the idea of America as the world policeman and that sort of thing. And there's a lot, also a lot of shame. And one of the things I write about is um, how Ronald Reagan gave a speech right at the beginning of his campaign in August of 1980, before before the veterans of foreign wars. And he said Vietnam is a Nobel with a Nobel cause, and that was colossally. You know, I write about this, but colossally controversial. You know, the idea that Reagan would speak of Vietnam in, in kind of positive terms. Um, and the pundits were like, this is the kind of thing that's going to finish him off as a presidential candidate. But what they didn't grasp was, at the level of popular culture, there was this enormous longing for innocence around Vietnam. And I write about um, a movie like The Deer Hunter, which, you know, like we say, like in this in the video game, you use a lot of stuff that America did in Vietnam, like, uh, or America's side did in Vietnam, like the My Lai Massacre, and just put it in the hands of the enemy. And um, it was enormously popular, an enormous critical success, except for the critics who called it Bacchus, and won the Oscar for Best Picture, right? So that kind of revisionist uh, mismaking can be enormously powerful and enormously reactive. Um, but I don't think that's really what's happening here. It's kind of a, a nice. Uh, it's more pop, and, more popcorn, more Michael more Bay. Pop. Yeah, it's more Mike. It's more Michael Bay than Lenny, Lenny Riefenstahl. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's the pole think, line. Yeah, I, I think There's the my um, money quote right there. Yeah. One of the things that's always stuck out at me, and I, I've talked about this before on on the podcast, so radio listeners have heard me talk about this, but. In the first Modern Warfare game, which was the first time this series broke from World War II and tried to make a game about the War on Terror, there's a sequence mm -hmm. where the entire thing is you're playing through an action sequence from the perspective of a gun operator aboard an AC-130 gunship. And you are basically, like, you know, flying at high altitude, shooting down using um, the gunship's, like, infrared camera into uh, this sort of action sequence. And I remember critics at the time really loved the sequence because it was very eerie. It captured the strange, uncanny remoteness of modern warfare. Mm. But there was this tendency to ascribe meaning to it, where it's like, ah, you know, there's a critique here of how cold-blooded and, like, mechanically ruthless warfare has become. And one of the things that I've always remembered is when that critique was presented, when that was presented to developers on the game as a reading of the scene. They were mm -hmm. kind of perplexed by the entire thing. They were like, "Oh no, we just we just put that in because that is that's a cool. uh, that's a major part of you know the way these wars are being fought now." Um, and it never occurred to them, even though the game it was a disturbing sequence in some ways. It never occurred to any of them that there would be anything weird about it, or people might find it off-putting. And if anything, I think the series has, over time, uh, tried to make it a little clearer that, like, whatever you like, whatever might be going on, the troops, the infantry, is at the very least a hero. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. um well, I mean, I think a lot, a lot of people don't, you know, who are in the civilian world and the kind of blue state world, don't know what goes on in modern warfare. You know. And, um, you know, I mean, whatever we can say about this game, the fact that, you know, there are lots of young men going off to places like, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, coming back, you know, after being in that pressure cooker, you know, does a lot more that harms kind of the body politic than, than this video game. You know, I, I actually have a, a final thought, actually. It's kind All of right. A funny Reagan era thought. I've been doing some research uh, for possible article more on public health <laughs> uh public health and, and 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 the AIDS crisis and the COVID crisis and i've been doing a lot of research on d everett coop yep. you guys know about him mm -hmm. 
The Ever Coop was a very right wing uh, doctor who was a heroic surgeon and also a big pro life activist. And the Reagan Reagan made him his surgeon general, almost was kind of like a stop to the Christian right, partially because he didn't really intend to do all that much for the Christian right. And uh, so, you know, until the AIDS crisis, uh, until 1987, actually, uh, the Ever Coop is this kind of background figure who doesn't do much or say much or get much attention can you but explain really his... like can you explain what he looks like physically too because i think that's a big oh, yeah, part yeah. of like see well, yeah yeah it's a, it's a kind of a funny thing the, the surgeon general wears a admiral's uniform which is very bizarre so he's this doctor who wears an admiral's uniform and if you want to know what his beard looks like look at the guy who's the head of the centers for disease control now robert redfield who clearly worships the eric hoop because he has a favorite coop beard. He had this funny beard with no mustache. So he kind of looked like Abraham Lincoln of the biblical prophet. Anyway, one of his big, his first big crusades as Surgeon General was um, video games. And he worried that video games were uh, harmful to public health and to children's, uh, you know, kind of moral and emotional development. And that was a huge issue when I was a kid in 1980, when kind of standalone console games, you know, big, big, you know, video game, Pac-Man style video games were, you know, kind of just starting out. And uh, so he, uh, he, he, so he labels uh, video games as possibly hazardous to the, the the public health and the health of the young, but he kind of crossed wires with Ronald Reagan uh, because, uh, so, so Steve Recruit said there's nothing constructive in the game. <laughs> uh, but Ronald Reagan shortly after rhapsodized. He, he talked about the incredible hand, eye, and brain co co coordination, quote unquote, the kids were developing from video games. Uh, and here's a quote from him. The Air Force believes these kids will be outstanding pilots should they ever fly our jets. <laughs> so, you know, Frank <laughs> was very, very pro-violent video game. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> so let's uh, end with that. Yeah. Rob, so, you um, yeah, just to, just to take us out, uh, thanks for joining us on the stream. Uh, I do have a question for you. For people who have enjoyed your appearance here and uh, have enjoyed like some of the things we've talked about, should they start with Reaganland or should they go all the way back uh, oh, to Goldwater, to Before the I mean, they definitely all stand alone. If you're interested in the 60s, you yeah. should read Mix and Land. Uh, and they are a series that kind of work together until you know a very long arc. Um... But um, that's up to the reader. I don't care what they read first, as long as they buy them all. I've got, um, I have an answer for this, because I started with Nixon Land, because I've been okay. reading through all of them this year. And Nixon Land, somebody had gifted it to me, uh, and um, it took me a while to get to it, but I did. And Nixon Land is a fantastic place to start. Um, mm. And then because then you can go kind of in either direction. You can go back to before the storm and kind of get the beginning of things. And then you've got like... Invisible Bridge and Reagan Land to kind of go forward, but like Nixon is such a central figure to the American imagination, and I think that like Goldwater hasn't survived in the American imagination quite as much as like Nixon has. So I think mm -hmm. like nailing down Nixon, well, the the Nixon Land stuff really gives people an understanding of your style and like kind of what mm -hmm. you do, which is much more, uh, which I would describe as. Um, it's a history of America's relationship to these people, as well as it being, you know, biographies of them and their political careers, right? Uh, it is these very interesting histories of American and the cultural landscape at the same time. And the Nixon one, I think, is a really good place to start. That's my two cents. Great. But you, uh, yeah, that's, you probably file the most, that's probably the most beloved of all of them. But I think um, the third book is kind of the sleeper. I think it's kind of most morally intense uh, and kind of goes into the, the strangeness of the American psyche in kind of the deepest way. It's a, yeah, the, the coolest title. Yeah, before uh, The Invisible Bridge. That's the one I'm, I'm reading that one right now. And there's a lot of great stuff that, I mean, the Goldwater stuff, you really see the beginning of a lot of things, but like, if you really want to understand the current political moment and how we got where we are now, like, Invisible Bridge really lays a lot of it out, I think. Uh, one, one last question for you, Rick. Uh, somebody mentioned this in, in chat. Uh, obviously, your books uh, provide a history of sort of the origins of the conservative movement, but in terms of like un understanding the more, uh, like the last 20 years of it, and uh, like, like 
thinking on the conservative side. Where do you go to mm-hmm. understand that, to follow that part of the conversation? Because um, somebody did mention, like, if you look at a lot of the uh, things that are written in conservative intellectual circles, a lot of it's pretty dog shit. Um, a yeah. lot of it's pretty wretched. Where do you go? Like, where do you go for a decent, like, fair look at what intellectual grounding there is to any of this? Oh, uh, I, I mean, that, that doesn't. You know, I'm not actually a big fan of intellectual history and what intellectuals do and understanding how politics works. So I don't spend a lot of time doing that. I think kind of what intellectuals do when it comes to politics is kind of come up with the ex post facto um, yeah. kind of allies or explanations about, you know, what's already happening. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that, I'm afraid. But I really enjoy the um, um, two guys who really handle this extremely well. Uh, are the podcasters who do a podcast called uh, Know Your Enemy, and those 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 are the, I think the guys you're looking for. Cool. Well, what was the right. what was that book you name checked for me earlier today before we got on? Um, oh, uh, you mean the 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 gun power one? Yeah, no, not gun power. It was the other one, the one about between John Wayne and Jesus. Is that? Yeah, I haven't read that yet, but that seems like a really good book about um, you know. Just how you know, sort of violent and and kind of um, hate-filled the Christian right is, uh, and and kind of rooted in toxic masculinity. So I can't really endorse that, but a lot of people think it's really good. Well, it's a perfect fit for gamers. Uh, I think they'll go. get a lot out of it. Uh, Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank everyone you. who watched, um, buy Rick's books. Uh, ch- check them out. And uh, continue watching and reading and listening to uh, to Waypoint. Um, that'll do it for tonight's stream. Rick, thanks a ton. Uh, I hope we can do something like this again at some point. It was a blast. Sure thing. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody.